The following is an ESPN special presentation. Five months ago, a new IndyCar Memorial Day Classic was born. Today, the old and the new come together in the Irish Hills of Southern Michigan at the inaugural US 500. For the sport of IndyCar racing, today is a race day like none that has ever gone before. For the participants themselves, today is the most important day of the season. These are professional racing drivers, the best in the world at what they do. They have won championships at every level of motorsports, from local titles as boys to world championships as adults. In a few hours, one of these men will occupy a very special place in the records. His name will be inscribed on a silver cup that embodies the spirit of the American racing tradition. Wide open, high speeds, and even higher stakes. With that place in history will go a more tangible reward, a check for $1 million. Today is not just any race day. Race fans in 198 countries around the world are looking on for Memorial Day in America, the most important day of the year, not only for an IndyCar driver, but for his car owner, their families, crews, and sponsors as well. For all of them, the month of May will never be the same. A complicated story can be distilled to one simple fact. For the first time ever, the stars of IndyCar are not racing at Indianapolis on the last weekend in May. They are here in Michigan, preparing to take on the challenge of 500 miles. Everyone has their own opinion on the issues, but racers have a saying, when the green flag drops, the talking stops. The family dynasties are on hand, the Unzers and the Andrettis. Rick Mears, winner of more 500 mile races than any other driver in the history of the sport. Roger Penske, who owns this great racing facility, Michigan International Speedway, the fastest track in the sport. For Carl Haas, an opportunity to extend the long list of racing champions he has brought here. For his co-owner and the Newman Haas team, Paul Newman, an even more special treat. He will drive the pace car that will send the inaugural running of the US 500 on its way. The time for talking is past. It's time to go racing in Michigan. For nearly a century, they have raced toward this moment. In the early days of the automobile, American motorsports attracted the world's greatest drivers. They came seeking a silver trophy, the Vanderbilt Cup. This international competition helped give birth to America's premier open-wheeled racing championship, IndyCar. Today, IndyCar remains true to that early formula, the best from around the world, battling the homegrown heroes on every type of track. Now comes the dawn of a new day for IndyCar racing, the inaugural US 500. An event as spectacular as the sport itself, as big as the American dream. The familiar names are here. Andretti, Unser, Gordon, Deferan, Vassar, Rahal, Pruitt, Tracy, Boesel, Ribeiro, and Fittipaldi, ready to fight for a special page in the record books. And for the first time in more than a half century, the best in the world are once again racing for that silver trophy, the Vanderbilt Cup. Welcome to History, May 26, 1996. The grandstands are filling up. The crowd expected in excess of 120,000 people, the largest IndyCar crowd ever at Michigan International Speedway. And the race that they are here to watch will be something special indeed. A new day in IndyCar. The drivers are ready. And now with the all-important command, the Honorable John Engler, Mayor, Governor, that is, of the state of Michigan. Gentlemen, start your engines. Engines are fired. Let's get down to the starting grid, where one of our three pit reporters for today's race, James Allen, is standing by with a very interested spectator. David, this is a world-class event. One of your cars is on the front row. Surely this must be the most fun you've ever had without laughing. If, uh, if, if this doesn't make you very, very excited, then you're not hooked up right. What does it mean to you as a team owner to be here today? Well, for, for getting that, it's just a thrill to be here. I mean, my God, look, look what we're about to do. and. Uh, 
To be lucky enough to know these people involved in this sport is a, a real thrill and an honor for me. Back to you, Bob. Hi, above Michigan International Speedway. Hello again, everyone. I'm Bob Varsha. American racing fans have grown accustomed to spending Memorial Day weekend with their IndyCar favorites doing battle over the classic 500-mile distance. And so it is this year, except for the fact that the race has moved from Indianapolis to here at Michigan, the sport's fastest track. And all the controversy over that fact is about to be muffled by the sound of racing engines, which is as it should be. With me to bring you all the action of today's race, a two-time winner over 500 miles here at Michigan, Scott Goodyear. Scott, race day is always important, but this weekend is huge for these drivers and teams. It really is. This is the biggest race of the year for everybody that's here. It's 500 miles. You have to be there at the end to win the event. We see Jimmy Vassar has won $100,000 so far for winning the pole position. This is a million dollars. Usually we race all season long to catch a million dollars at the end of the season. We're going to have it here in one day today. In fact, we're going to have it in about three hours. Let's take a look at our Miller starting grid. Across the front row of three, Jimmy Vassar from San Francisco, California, Mexican Adrian Fernandez, and Brian Herta from Dublin, Ohio. On row two, a rookie at Michigan, Alex Zanardi, along with Alonzer Jr. and Andre Rivero. On row three, Paul Tracy, Emerson Fittipaldi, who won his first IndyCar race here at Michigan, and Scott Pruitt. On row four will be Raul Boisel, Michael Andretti, and Christian Fittipaldi. Row five will have Gilles de Ferran, Mauricio Gujelmin, and Bobby Rahal, still looking for his first victory over 500 miles at Michigan. He's won here several times before at shorter distances. On row six will be Parker Johnstone, who sat on the pole for the Marlboro 500 here a year ago, along with Greg Moore, the spectacular young Canadian rookie, and Eddie Lawson, another rookie here at Michigan. On row seven, Englishman Mark Blundell, also a rookie, along with Roberto Moreno of Brazil, making his return to Michigan after a 10-year absence, and Robbie Gordon. On row eight, Stefan Johansson of Sweden, alongside his countrymen, the rookie Frederick Ekblom and Jeff Krosnov in one of the Toyota-powered entries. And on row nine, Hiro Matsushita of Japan, Juan Manuel Fangio II, a rookie here at Michigan, and Gary Bettenhausen back after three years out of a race car, racing for his brother Tony's team. There's a look at our race analysis. 250 laps, 500 miles total. The pole sitter, Jimmy Vassar, picked up a Marlboro Pole Award of $100,000. He can also pick up another $45,000 in rollover bonuses if he can win from the pole position. The winner's purse, a minimum of $1 million. In today's field, you see the chassis listed, including Ann Gurney's All-American Eagle Racer, Eagle Mark V, the engines from Ford, Mercedes, Honda, and Toyota. Tires, of course, from Goodyear and Firestone. Now we have a new, new experimental pit rule change in effect here at Michigan. Here's what will happen. When a yellow flag goes up, the pits will be closed. They will then open once the field is under control and in line behind the safety car. Once for the lead lap cars. One lap later, the lap cars may come in for pit service. When there is one lap remaining to green and the field is on the track, they will split. The lead lap cars up high, lap cars down low. No passing until the field crosses the start finish line at the green flag. Earlier today, we talked with Rick Mears about what the likely impact of this new rule will be. Well, you know, I like the new procedure, I think, for, for several reasons. Uh, one of them, most importantly, is safety. Uh, because when they, they close the pit lane, when it goes yellow, now guys won't be racing back to the pit to try to get an advantage, which in turn ends up making you race through the crash or whatever. So now everybody can just slow down. They won't lose anything, get into the pits, get their stops done and get out. Secondly, it's going to bunch up the show. It's going to keep the show tight. It's going to keep the front runners together. Uh, if you have a problem, I've had them over the years a lot of times. You cut a tire, you get down a lap, something like that. Now when you pull out into the lower lane, you'll be closer to the front and be able to race to get your lap back. So it'll, it'll allow you to get back into the show the way it should be. So I, I think it's going to be you know, quite a bit better in, in a lot of different aspects, better for timing and scoring and everything else. Well, one of the things they'll have to do down here on pit road is IndyCar needs a way to communicate immediately with the crews. What is the status down here? First of all, here is a red flag with a P, meaning that the pits are closed. Then a very large poster board, in this particular case, meaning that the pits are open if you're minus a lap or more. Flip over this poster board. This is when the leaders will come in. They'll communicate that to the crews. And they'll probably be busy down here if we hit a yellow, guys. All right, thank you, Jan, along with James Allen and Marty Reed. Jan will be patrolling the pit lane. 
The ceremonial pace cars have pulled off on this all-important occasion. We are ready for the traditional three-wide start at the controls of the pace car. Actor racing driver Paul Newman, eminently qualified to pace the field for this important race. So much at stake. A crowd of over 120,000 on hand and all of the familiar teams of IndyCar racing. Each individual in this great racing plant has their own reason for being here, but make no mistake, history will be made here today at Michigan. The field, perhaps the most qualified in IndyCar history, world championships in both Formula One cars and sports cars. Seven IndyCar titles, 131 total IndyCar victories between them. Jimmy Vassar, who has won three of the first five races of the season and is the points leader coming into this race, will bring the field up to speed. And we have a crash in turn four. A crash approaching the green flag. And many, many cars are involved. Well, something has obviously gone wrong and cold tires. Maybe that might be the possibility, a half shaft braking. It looked like uh, one of the cars went directly 90 degrees to the right, so we're not quite sure. And uh, we got quite a collision here on our hands. At least nine cars involved, at least nine cars stationary right now. No idea how many may be damaged, but still circulating. I see Eddie Lawson's car going by, missing half of its rear wing. You see the drivers climbing out of their cars. There is Jimmy Vassar, the pole sitter. As he makes his way away, right? we have a red flag on the racetrack. Obviously, this cannot continue. We have a red flag, all stop, and we'll start all over again. Let's get down to Jan Bikas in the pit lane. Bob, because we have a red flag, we're down here with the Ganassi Racing Crew, and they're quickly working on Jimmy Vassar's spare car. They are one of the few teams that has brought a spare car to pit road. They are hoping that they will be able to use this car. Of course, they'll have to wait for a ruling from IndyCar, but the crew frantically down here trying to get this car ready. There is the scene from high overhead. Now we get word from the officials that backup cars will be eligible for the restart. On the left, Jimmy Vassar. On the right, Brian Herta talking the whole situation over. They were two of the three cars on the front row. And the action began right up there on the front row. It appears that all the drivers are out of their cars. The safety crews are working on them. Let's take another look, Scott. Well, it looks like Jimmy Vassar on the pole position just turned right. Now, I would say something must have went wrong with the car because if he got on the gas too soon on cold tires, usually the car would go to the inside like we've seen before numerous times. And this just turned right. So we're not quite sure why that is. So the guys are going evenly side by side and a little bit of acceleration will come up here very shortly. I would say those two cars between Fernandez and Vassar are very close, very close. The left front wheel of Fernandez was hooking on the inside of Jimmy Vassar's right rear, and I would say those guys are probably just a little bit too close for the start. Take another look and watch the action behind them as the second and third rows take evasive action. Vassar's car, the red one, spears up, touches Fernandez, collects Brian Herta. Andre Ribeiro into the wall behind Herta. See Alonzo Jr. and Paul Tracy down low. They may have escaped the debris. Gilles de Ferran involved. And collisions at the back as well, because keep in mind, the cars at the back of the field are going every bit as quickly as those up front. Well, many things are happening for the guys at the rear of the field. They're trying to miss everybody that's uh, having problems in front of them if they're spinning. And you're also watching for debris as the debris is maybe coming down across the track or as you saw, maybe a few tires are bouncing off the pavement and you want to make sure that they're not going to come down and land on top of you. But this is something that is just horrendous on the start because uh, the guys are wanting to turn around. Here's a different view right now. I've seen the guys from the rear package and would say everybody's very close not wanting to give an inch here on the, uh, the very beginning of the race. Looks like uh, Fernandez is just coming down to catch the rear wheel of Jimmy Vassar. And then it's all skate behind as everybody gets on the brakes. I have never seen anything like this, certainly not at IndyCar racing. So many cars involved as they approach the green flag. Literally half the field involved. Now you ride on board Vassar's car, looking to the rear. Let's watch and listen. Well, there you go. Jimmy, you could tell by the in-car camera, was not accelerating. It was even throttle, and obviously the two guys just touched wheels, and off they went. And a melee ensued. There is Alex Zanardi, Jimmy Vassar's teammate, sitting in his car in the pit area. There you see some of the damage, the residue of a spectacular collision. We'll be right back, live to Michigan.
From aboard one of the safety vehicles at Michigan International Speedway, you watch the cleanup continue as a spectacular crash approaching the green flag for this inaugural US 500 has taken out at least 12 cars. There's action in the pit lane, and Jan Bikas is standing by with a pole sitter. Jimmy Vassar has made his way down to pit road. Jimmy, what happened? I don't know. The car just turned violently right. I was just coming on to power. Uh, I was still low in the revs. I hadn't even really, you know, wasn't really on it yet. It just turned right so hard and fast. It was, it was, it was ridiculous. Felt like I got hit in the back or something broke on the car. It just, it just turned right. It looked like from what they could see from the onboard chart shots, there was contact out there. Could you, could you ever imagine starting from pole something like this could happen? I mean, that racing, anything can happen. I mean, I feel bad for the whole Target Chip Ganassi team and. Uh, uh, you know, but fortunately, we'll probably get a shot to go back in our backup here. I, you know, I'm just dumbfounded. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Okay, we'll let you get back to your business here, guys. He did run this car on Friday, so he is familiar with this car. Let's get down to James Allen. Well, also absolutely dumbfounded as to what happened there. Watching the rerun on the television, Brian Herter. What's your your perspective? Well, you know, it looks like Jimmy and Adrian got squeezed together there somehow, and. Yeah, you know, it shouldn't be happening at the start of the race. It's a uh, really disaster for us because the uh, shell car felt great all week in practice. We spent a lot of time with that car. Looks like we're going to get to make the start of the race with the backup shell car, but uh, you know, it's, it's a tough way to start your weekend. Tell us about your disappointment, a front row start, all of that, a million dollars of the prize, and now you're going to have to be in a backup car. How do you feel? Still on the front row. Still on the front row. That's a real fighter. Now let's join Marty with Emerson Fittipaldi. Yes, and Emerson trying to describe what was going on. What did happened out there from your perspective? Well, it looks like uh, Jim Vass and Adrian, they hit each other in the start. And as they start spinning, the second row and the third row, everybody tried to avoid. And I back off and I turned the steering wheel, I spun. And then I had a, a rear wheel with a suspension piece hitting my nose. That was the only damage. I hope everything will be fine. So the suspension, everything else is okay on your car. You'll be able to get this one back for the restart. Yeah, it looks like because I, I haven't hit anybody. Just a, a rear wheel land on my nose. Yeah, there's a big scuff mark, guys, on the front of the car. That's, uh, it's really amazing. Uh, just a few more feet, it might have been in the cockpit. Jan? All has gone down to the Valvoline team that, of course, provides all the methanol fuel here, and they're getting ready to top off each and every one of the cars. They will fill each one of these plastic containers, then walk down the grid and refill for any of the fuel that has been burned off during those pace laps. So they will get the opportunity to start as they would a few laps ago. Let's get back now to James. Well, Gilles de Ferran, you know a few things about bad luck, particularly this season. What's your view on all of this? Well, somebody spun right at the front of the field, and uh, that gave a, a chain reaction, a big accident. I was picking my way through the debris, going in first gear, and uh, I thought I was safe, and somebody hit me in the back and destroyed the left rear suspension. So we're going to try to fix it and get back on it. How severe is the damage? Uh, the left rear suspension is gone, so <laughs> we're going to have to put all new parts on it, but I think we'll have enough time to do that. Good luck to you, Jill. Thank you. Okay, here's one more look. Vassar down low, Fernandez in the middle, Herta up high, a puff of smoke, and then all chaos breaks out. Watch the Marlboro Penske cars to the right as they manage to avoid it all, as did Alex Zanardi in the red Target Ganassi racing machine. But behind them, an absolute melee. We'll take a quick time out of return for more live coverage from Michigan International Speedway. We hope to talk with the director of competition for IndyCar, Kurt Russell, when we return. Stand by for more from MIS. There's Mauricio Gujamin in the pit lane. We are in about a 25 minute hold. Let's get down to the pit lane. James Allen standing by with Big Mo. Mauricio Gujamin, it must be every driver's worst nightmare. You're coming off turn four and uh, you have all kinds of chaos breaks out. What was your view on the whole thing? Well, I think it was pretty stupid, really. I think uh, it's a factor of the weather being a bit cold and leaving the cars in, sh in short gears. And what I saw was Jimmy Vassi got a little bit off shape, which probably touched Fernandez, sent him a, in a T-bone over hurt. And then after that, you got rid of two thirds of the front row. There was no more space for anybody to go by. What's your status? Are you going to restart? Well, they bring you my car back. And, but you have to make sure your, your car is pretty straight in this place. So the With Jeff Krosnoff, you wanted to talk about a brand new sponsor, but I don't think this was the way you wanted to do it. Well, heck no, I didn't want to introduce MCI into IndyCar racing this way, but um, you know, 
sometimes this stuff happens. I was at the back and uh, I saw the smoke going off uh, with trouble in front and everybody just, you know, they slowed down and it's just changed reaction and I was just, uh, Robbie was directly in front of me and slowed up really quickly and I moved to avoid him and people were spinning and I clipped somebody and just went caroming down the thing and uh, that was it. But you will be able to make the show with the backup car, oh, correct? Yeah. The uh, RCR Wells team is, is great for getting, I have two identically prepared cars it's already out here it's warmed up it's ready to go racing and it's going to be as good as our primary car so uh, that shouldn't be a problem well jeff said that all those years in japan mci actually kept his marriage together but uh, it couldn't save the car this time guys all right thanks very much marty i should repeat that to the best of our knowledge there have been no injuries reported from that incredible crash involving all of those cars from high overhead you get a good look at Michigan International Speedway under a layer of cloud cover that will keep the temperatures on the racetrack and in the air hopefully fairly cool throughout the afternoon and that will be good news for both the cars the engines and the tires on the monitor chip as a former driver what is your perspective on that accident well it wasn't really my perspective I think a better perspective was uh, Alex he saw the whole thing and he said he thought that Herta was down too low was squeezing Fernandez down and Fernandez didn't want to get out of it so he got in the side of Jimmy he said just came on the radio before I even said yellow he said Fernandez just hit Jimmy now what is going to happen here as far as your crew obviously we've seen some of the work that's going on with Jimmy's spare car but there's a lot of pieces to be changed he ran the car on Friday but yet there's some things you change telemetry wings things like that how much of a job is that pretty much quick stuff we got about 15 minutes I think and uh, the guy said no problem they're going to get it handled we'll be back there with our T car that's why we have a spare car now, what about the engine in that car? You ran it quite a bit on Friday. Was that a fresh engine? You're pretty confident that'll go 500 miles? Not the same engine. Ah, thank you, Chip. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jan. We'd like to apologize for our viewers. I understand we lost our transmission and went away from Michigan International Speedway briefly. There you see Mauricio Gujelmin's Reynard being towed into the pits after a huge crash that took out a large portion of this field. We're still under a red flag while the cleanup continues. The track down in turn four is basically clear as you look at another view. Watch the cars on the left. That puff of smoke indicates the tire to tire contact or tire to body work collision between Jimmy Vassar and Adrian Fernandez. We should point out Scott Goodyear. It's a very inexperienced front row and without a placing blame on anyone. I think experience might well be a factor in a situation like this. Well, we heard from Chip Ganassi and uh, a view from one of his other drivers, but I have to say that there was quite a space between Fernandez in the center row, uh, center of row one and then also Herda on the right hand side. So he probably had some room to move up to allow everybody to get down to the D part of the uh, oval here and then take a clean start. So I think they were just a little bit too close to each other in the start without a doubt. There is Al Unser Jr. and with him is James Allen. Well, one guy who's really smiling, not affected at all by that incident, Al Unser Jr. You've been hooked up really the whole time you've been here at Michigan. Does this play into your hands? Well, I don't know. You know, we'll just see if uh, uh, if the front row, if their backup cars are set up right and so on. You know, we don't we won't know that until we get out there and start running. But, uh, you know, it's just a shame it happened. How much testing have you done here at MIS in preparation for this event? We haven't really done an awful lot of testing. You know, we uh, we came here in uh, in April and did a little bit of running. But, uh, you know, the Marlboro Team Penske has done a great job in setting up the car. It came off the trailer good and, and uh, we're ready to go racing. Well, Bob and Scott, I think we should keep an eye on this guy. He's looking pretty confident. Let's get over to Marty. Hey, the guys are working hard on Gilles DeFerran's car because they are going to rebuild the entire right corner rather than bring out the backup car. And as they continue on the workload, I'm with uh, Jim Hall. And Jim, I guess the question is, why would you go this route? Why not just bring out the backup car? Well, the, the condition the backup car is in and the engine that's in it, we think that uh, we've got a better chance uh, with this uh, car and changing the right corner than uh, right rear corner than we do uh, in getting the other car ready to go and run 500 miles. We think that this, uh, this is the best thing Thing for us to do under the circumstances we, we don't know quite how much time we got here but we're we think we can do a good job of replacing the, the right rear corner and assuming we can get it uh, lined up properly I think it'll be fine are you worried at all about the chassis being tweaked no I think the chassis is fine we can tell from the damage that the, that the chassis is fine all right Jim Hall these guys are working feverishly Jan what you got well, we're standing by with Alex Zanardi, who we just spoke with Chip Ganassi. He said you had a great perspective on it. You think Herta came down? Well, great. In those moments, it's very difficult to understand what's going on. You try to keep your car out of all the debris. But uh, basically, what I saw is that Jimmy was in front, definitely in front of the two guys, and the two guys were really close together. Fernando moved 
Fernandez moved down uh, really close to Jimmy and Hertha followed him and uh, and he was really close to Fernandez so Fernandez didn't really had a nowhere to go he started to get a little bit nervous so he started to zigzag to avoid the contact with 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 Hertha and, uh, and he had no nowhere to go no place to go and he hit uh, and he hit uh, Jimmy now at that stage were you concerned about being caught up in that accident or did you think you'd have a lane to get through at that stage no, I didn't have any problem personally because I was uh, way in the inside and uh, uh, was more of a problem for Little Al, which was next to me, and uh, and for Ribeiro, which got caught in the accident. So, no, under that point of view, I didn't have any 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 problem. We just spoke with Allinger Jr. and we asked if this would play into his hands because his car was also unscathed. Do you think that gives you an advantage now with so many people in spare cars? Well, I know what Jimmy's spare car is, so I know that. Uh, at least with him, I, I'm not going to get any advantage. Uh, I don't know what, what it concerns Brian and, uh, and Fernandez. I hope so, because uh, it, would be, it would be a good help for me. Alex Zanardi doesn't look like he needs any help, guys. Well, Alex Zanardi making his first visit to the high banks here at Michigan has really had an experience. Here are the cars involved in the crash. De Ferran, Emerson Fittipaldi, Eddie Lawson, Jimmy Vassar from the front row, Frederick Ekblom, who is back in the rear of the field, Mauricio Gujamin, and Mark Blundell. They are not all. Also, Jeff Krosnoff, Brian Herta, Andre Ribeiro, Adrian Fernandez, Juan Fangio II, and Parker Johnstone, who sat on pole for the most recent 500-mile race here, the Marlboro 500, last summer. Preparations for a restart continue. We'll be back with more live from Michigan International Speedway in just a moment. Clouds beginning to part just a little bit. We may have sunshine here on the racetrack, and of course that will affect the setup of these cars. It's going to be a very interesting afternoon here at Michigan. Let's get down to pit lane and Marty Reed. Yeah, we'll get a historical perspective from one of the living legends of the sports, Dan Gurney. Your car survived. I guess it's the only advantage of being in the back row, but uh, this is not the first time that first lap uh, incidents have occurred. No, in fact, uh, historically, the first lap is probably the most dangerous lap of the race. But uh, I know I was involved in one in 66. We lost 10 cars, uh, and I never got to the first turn. So it was, uh, I mean, these things do happen. Exactly what triggered it, I, I haven't seen the film, so I don't know. How did Juan manage to escape it? Juan said he thought that uh, it had happened in the middle of the pack. He didn't realize it happened at the front, apparently. And uh, he was just being very cautious. He was thinking 500 miles, and uh, he managed to find a, a way to weave through and he was slowing down as much as he could. Thanks, Dan. Let's go to James Allen. James, what you got? Well, one car that's definitely far too badly damaged to restart is Adrian Fernandez's team owner, Steve Horn. What's the problem with the car? Well, the car got hit from behind and uh, initially the impression was it got some underwing and wastegate damage, which I, I thought we could... ...an upright and lower wishbone, so really it's not enough time to repair that. Now, what are you going to do? You've got another car, but, I mean, presumably you take some parts off that, or...? Well, we'd already started pulling pieces off that car, actually, in the hope of fixing this one, and uh, for a 500-mile race, you actually strip quite a few components off that car, so we're going to try and bolt that car back together and see if we can't get it out here. We're always told about cars are. I mean, they, they, you know, they, the finest adjustment makes all the difference in handling. Were you talking about building Meccano, throwing these pieces together to make a new car? Does that affect the handling? No, I don't think so. I think we should be able to put it back together pretty much the same. Uh, although we haven't run that car here, it's been on the setup pad every day, and we know the, the settings that this car's got now, so I think if we can get it back together, it should be okay handling-wise. Thanks, Steve. Let's catch up with the Ambikas. We're looking at the roll bar. That is the roll hoop from Parker Johnstone's machine. Look at the debris that was flying through the air and how close it actually got to Parker. It scraped across the roll hoop, but the crew at the moment right now is focused around the rear of the car because after that point, Parker Johnstone was T-boned by another car. There is a whole crew here working on the car. Of course, this is under red flag, so they can have as many people working on this car as they want. What they are changing is the headers or the exhaust system because that was damaged in the actual accident. At the moment, they are connecting the headers to the actual wastegate tube, and they hope to be able to effect repairs before IndyCar tells them they need to come back out onto the racetrack. This will take a while, but obviously Parker Johnstone, who is standing by with me at the moment, is hoping they'll be able to effect repairs. Parker, first of all, that mark on the roll hoop, what caused that? That was from either a left front or right front suspension and wheel tire combination. And we had the car slow down. We saw the chaos that was that was happening up in front of us. We went down, I went down low behind Jill DeFerrin 
thought everything was okay, looked up and saw this projectile coming through the air and ducked and it hit the roll hoop. Fortunately, I was very, very fortunate and bounced off the car. And, and at that point, I thought it had damaged the back of the car. I got out, made an inspection of the entire car, saw the damage to the side pod, uh, the front wings radioed into the crew, got cart to bump start me. We came back in and they started repairs. Now you said a projectile. When you and I were talking a minute ago, you think it was a whole corner of a car. How scary was that for you? Well, she asked me what, what was going through your mind. I, I thought, well, the last thing that's going to go through my mind is an upright. But, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where everything's happening in slow motion. You see the wheels bouncing down the racetrack, and I realized this still had the air arms attached to it. And I knew that that would be, uh, in technical terms, a very bad thing if it were to hit me. So I just got as low as I can, and um, God was very good to me, and it missed me. Now tell me, you've been watching over my shoulder as we describe them changing the headers, the wastegate, and so on. Obviously, if there's any kinks there, they have to replace that. What are your thoughts as far as if they can get it done in time? Well, from the first weekend where we, we had some problems and, and put in a qualifying performance, it was very disappointing to, to all of us. The Motorola Firestone Honda car is now up to speed. I think we've got a car capable of winning the race. I've got great confidence in this crew, and it's through adversity that you really see the, the merit of a crew. And these guys, uh, both the Japanese Honda team, the American Honda team, some of the Firestone guys and the Bricks Comtech guys are hard at work on this thing, and I have absolute confidence that it'll go back on the track the way it came off. Still a long race. Jacques was uh, 20 laps down and finished 10th last year. I think there's no reason at all why we can't go for a win here, provided we can get this back together in time. Now tell me, a lot of guys have gone to spare cars. You guys have one of the nicest looking cars out here, but a lower budget than many people. So you don't have a spare car available? We have a car that's more of a rolling parts inventory for us, but it's not set up in speedway con uh, configuration. So uh, through the goodness of some of the other teams and through Renard, we were able to get the parts necessary to put this thing back together. We have no spare car. Puts us at a disadvantage because right now getting the wing angles reset, uh, they've checked all the suspension. I'm sure we took a hit to the right front, but they don't see any obvious damage. We're going to spend the first few laps really feeling this out before we, we go because it is a long race. And as long as we can make some changes during the pit stops, we should be okay. Parker Johnstone, not only lucky today, but also has a lot of confidence. Bob? You need to have a lot of confidence to drive this racetrack the way Parker Johnstone has for the Bricks Comtech Motorola sponsored team. Here's another look at the accident now from the nose camera on Bobby Rahal's Renard. And certainly what Bobby's doing is getting off the gas, picking his way through all the debris, but also the smoke. You sort of hope that when you get through that patch of smoke, that there's not a race car there. He's weaving in and out of the parts. The key thing here is that you're very happy that they're going to have a restart because there will be a lot of debris in the tires, and you don't want to be going out there doing 230 miles an hour, wondering if you picked up something in the tire, and you might end up getting a soft tire. And he got through that with the wisdom of experience. Bobby Ray Hall has raced here for many years, won three times at shorter distances, but has yet to pick up his first 500-mile victory here at Michigan. Now let's get back down to the pit lane and James Allen. Well, Bob, a slightly different perspective on all this, the game of tiptoe through the tulips, which is what Scott Pruitt was playing. Tell us about it. Well, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but somehow or another it looked like Vassar and Fernandez got together and, and, and Vassar's car hooked straight up, um, taking out Herta. And as soon as it hit the wall, I mean, all hell broke loose. I mean, there was tires flying and debris flying. I managed to just kind of weave my way through it without hitting anything, but uh, it was uh, it was pretty dramatic. Now, Al Jr.'s got a smile like the cat who got the cream. You've got a completely undamaged car as well. We know you've been really hooked up the whole time you've been here at Michigan, perhaps lacking a little in horsepower, but you're confident now. Yeah, no, we were confident before the race. Uh, the Patrick guys have done a great job. Firestone showed they've proved they have a great tire. Um, you know, we're ready to go racing. We're, we're happy we didn't get anything. We just had a, a little piece of debris that hit the car. Uh, one of them kind of nicked the rear wing, but, but nothing to really. Thanks a lot, Scott. Over to Marty. Uh, I'll tell you what, guys, you're watching 12 guys working fast and furious. This is Mauricio Guldsman's PacWest operation at its best. These guys had their backup car, and they took all the Super Speedway parts off yesterday in hopes of getting a jump on, guess what, next week at Milwaukee. So it's set up for the shorter one-mile oval for Milwaukee. That meant that they had no option but to go ahead and put all the spare parts that were already off the uh, spare car on this one. And they think they're going to make it. I have never seen 12 guys. It's like a chorus. I have yet to see one step on anyone else's toes. Thanks, Marty. Looking out over these jam-packed grandstands, no one has left the grandstand to head for the concession areas. Everyone is watching the pit lane as these teams work furiously to get the field reassembled. Now, in real time, let's ride with Ray Hall again. As you can hear, Bobby's on the throttle, just ready to get onto it as soon as he sees a green. He's leaving some distance, and that's experience paying off for you right there. And here we go. Picking his way through all the debris. You can hear he's back on the throttle. 
you're watching through your peripheral vision too to see where all that parts are coming from because they're coming from every which angle. Well, that was the first thing that struck me when we saw that in real time. He left himself so much room. And as you say, that comes from experience. The work continues down in the pit lane. The grid slowly reforming. We'll be back with more live coverage as we prepare for the restart here at Michigan. More of the inaugural U.S. 500 coming up. Welcome back to Michigan International Speedway. Here's yet another look at the accident that has brought us to a red flag. We're getting close to the time for a restart. Once again, cars flying in every direction. Christian Fittipaldi working the steering, working the brakes, working the throttle, trying to stay out of harm's way. Well, I can tell you from a driver's point of view, because I had a start here a few years ago when Paul Tracy had a starting accident and parts are flying everywhere. If your heart rate's controlled and ready for the start, which it's usually at its highest rate ever, it goes right off the meter when parts start to fall out of the sky like that, and you're hoping that you just get through all the debris. There is Christian Fittipaldi getting ready to restart. Down in the pit lane, let's go to Marty Reed. Yeah, we're down here with Greg Moore, and I guess the main question for you is, how did you manage to escape it? I'm really not too sure. I guess uh, all I saw was a bunch of cars crashing, some guys sliding down the racetrack, so I took to the grass, and I'm lucky that I did. I guess my old days before my four in the Jeep paid off. A little agricultural racing. Listen, what's it do to the mental process now? I mean, you get yourself psyched for these things. It's like getting up for the big game, the Super Bowl, and here we go, and all of a sudden, you got a big delay. What's going through your mind as we get ready with the jet dryer in the background? Well, really for me, it's just uh, to try and do what I've been doing. You know, I've never done a 500 mile race before, so I'm still in the same mindset I was at the beginning of the race. And, you know, it, it had nothing to do with me. It wasn't my fault that any of this happened. So I think some of the other guys will be, you know, their, their minds will change a little bit now. But for me, it's just the same thing. I'm just looking forward to the race. I mean, the, the players team has had some bad luck this year, but we had good luck there and hopefully it continues for the rest of the race. Jan Bikas, what you got for us? Well, Marty, just updating on the other cars that are on pit road. To my left here, the Gallus crew has been working very hard, and the entire left corner of Eddie Lawson's car has been replaced. All the suspension members, the rear wing, they have done a tremendous job of replacing this car in a very short period of time. If you look across this car, you'd never know that this was involved in the incident. This car is just about ready to go. They actually did a quick alignment with this car, actually right out here on pit lane. They're pretty confident, but let's find out how confident Eddie Lawson is. Is you saw these guys hard at work. That was an amazing job how fast they got that done. Unbelievable. I can't believe they practically changed the whole back of the car. But uh, yeah, we almost made it through. I was following uh, Ray Hall through there, and we actually got through the mess and all the carnage and everything. And I thought, all right, I made it, and then got hit up the rear. And I guess somebody got backwards and got me. Now, what are your feelings as far as going out doing your first 500 mile race now in a car that's just been set up here on pit road? Obviously, these guys know what they're doing. Does that give you confidence to go stand on it again? Oh, absolutely. I don't even have to worry about it or think about it. Just go out there and go for it. Now, some people are speculating the start was a little bit too slow. Do you think that's the case? I don't think so. I think maybe, uh, I guess, a couple guys got into each other on the front, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure, but it seemed like uh, it was fine from where I was at. All right, let's get to James Allen. Thank you, Eddie. Well, we've heard a lot from the young guys who are involved in this accident. Let's talk to the voice of experience. Mario Andretti, you've seen many accidents. You've seen many successful starts in your time. What was your view of this? Well, it looks to me like the front row forgot that there were three abreast. Uh, looked like a lot of movement from the, the man in the center. He never really established a position there. And, uh, and it just touched wheels. And of course, the inevitable happens after that. You were known very much in your racing career for your mental toughness. At a time like this, what goes to a driver's mind? Is he more or less nervous than before the first start? Well, of course, this is the most, the, the most tense moment of the race. And uh, a lot of mistakes are made under those circumstances. I think uh, we all talk about that uh, over and over and over. And uh, young or old, you know, we're all pretty much vulnerable to some of these mistakes. Thanks a lot, Mario. Let's catch up with Marty Reed. Yeah, we're with Robbie Gordon, and I guess uh, the question for you is, you're the off-road king. Greg Moore told us that he managed to go off-road and uh, miss this. How did you escape it? Well, I, I just, um, I saw it coming. I was more worried about the guys behind me running into me and not getting slowed down. So I was just trying to move up to the high side and stay out of the out of the wreckage. But um, by doing that, I had to run through a lot of it. So we had to change tires. Um, a lot of guys are changing cars, so we still got a basic setup, just different set of tires. So we talked about mental process with him. What's it like for you? What are you going through right now? Well, um, you know, it's, it's just going to be like another start. I mean, I'm still in my same race car, so 
it's not as mental for me as it is for like Jimmy or other guys like that that have to swap into different cars that they're not 100% comfortable with. Well, you were complaining about you just weren't able to get enough power. Is this a great equalizer then in this restart? You're going to have an advantage? I don't know if we're going to have an advantage, but um, you know, the, the, the key here is that the, at this race, it always comes down to staying around till the end of it. So that's our game plan. We're going to ride for 450 miles, and then we have to go race in the last 50. We will. If not, we'll just drive around home. Okay, that's Robbie Gordon, Bob. Thanks very much, guys. You see, the excitement was too much for at least one of our corner workers. We're just a few minutes from refiring the engines, and we'll take another shot at starting the inaugural US 500. Cars are on the grid, drivers in many of the cars will be back. Don't go away. Back live at Michigan moments ago, the PA announcer announced drivers to your cars. It was met with a round of applause from the huge crowd gathered to watch the likes of Robbie Gordon right there and the rest of this field get underway in the inaugural running of the US 500. After a titanic crash coming down to the green flag, the race was red flagged and we are now barely five minutes from the order to restart the engines. As you look down from our Honda Helicam, weather continues to improve we still have virtually total cloud cover but the air is warming and it should be a great race once we get it underway the field is forming up I don't see any cars missing from the grid right now but that's purely unofficial as work continues in Adrian Fernandez's pit Andre Ribeiro also still being worked on while the rest of the cars are pushed out to the three by three starting positions you know, Bob, we talk about the mindset of the drivers, and I've uh, been through this sort of program before where you're waiting either on a rain delay or what have you. You always play uh, games with yourself and get yourself worked back up to the start. The key thing that's impressive here is that all the mechanics up and down pit road have been thrown into literally the deep end, changing parts on cars, taking cars off of spare cars to put onto the primary car, or getting the backup car out. It's really amazing to see what the mechanics have done here in a short space of about half an hour. So look at Greg Boer, one of the drivers in this field, many drivers in this field who picked up a lot of speed from qualifying two weeks ago to final practice yesterday. Picked up about eight miles per hour. The field virtually all well up in the 220s. Work continues on several of the cars. Now we have unofficial word that Adrian Fernandez might not return for the restart. Meanwhile, let's get down to James Allen in the pit lane. Well, Bob, this race is always a race of tough reliability, a high, high attrition rate in this race. And of course, everyone starts out with new cars, new chassis, and as much as possible, brand new uprights, suspensions, and gearboxes. But what, of course, a lot of people haven't got is new equipment in their spare cars. And a lot of people today are going to be restarting this race with old equipment. So we have to hope that the reliability problems don't strike them. Over to John. Down to Jan Bikas. Thanks, Bob. One of the interesting scenes we just saw right next to Greg Moore, who you saw a picture of a moment ago, was Parker Johnstone now giving the thumbs up. He went across, high-fived all of his crew. They wheeled the car back, and he was super excited. Of course, Parker's always excited, but even more so than usual. He was so impressed. They got this car ready, and we saw just behind us moments ago, Gilles DeFerrin's car was wheeled behind us. Looks like he will get onto his grid spot in time. So, just like you said up top, these guys, the mechanics in particular, have done a great job absolutely they labor so long and hard and now it appears they have the field substantially back in place a hole in the middle of that row alongside Robbie Gordon Roberto Moreno there you see him Mark Blundell's car on the outside we'll be back to reassess Andre Ribeiro has made it back to the grid as well if you want to know everything that goes on on this Memorial Day weekend in motorsports check out RPM tonight at a special time this evening 12 a.m. Eastern Time. That'll be midnight Eastern for highlights of this U.S. 500, the Indy 500, and the Coca-Cola 600 as well. Kenny Main and the gang will have all of it for you on RPM tonight at midnight Eastern. Back live at Michigan. There you see the car without the bodywork. That's Adrian Fernandez's machine, the only car not to make the regrid. See the front right tire off the ground as they wheel it out. Yeah, I would say they still have some work to do to that car up in the pit lane, but they're going to get up and get working on it and hopefully get everything together. We see Adrian Fernandez sitting there and uh, going a lot through and through his mind, I'm sure. Marty Reed is down there as the cars roll off. And uh, very disappointed, Adrian Fernandez. Are you guys going to be able to get back into this? Uh, it's going to be hard. You know, the guys have done a terrific job, but there's, there was not enough time. And uh, 
my car was the last to be being picked up, so we just didn't have enough time. We didn't know exactly what was the damage, and we took some pieces from the spare car into the other one, and then we realized we couldn't make it. So then we came back to the spare car, and we don't have enough time, so it's just going to be hard. So you got any confidence in the spare car you're getting in? Yeah, I do. I have confidence in my guys, but there is, you know, there is no time now. So I mean, we, I just have to start whenever they finish and go into the race. Adrian Fernandez, very disappointed, guys. Wow, what a run of luck for Adrian Fernandez. A year ago, racing for Rick Gallus, he nearly won. He was in contention for victory at the Marlboro 500, but had to avoid a pit stop, go out through the pit lane, make another lap. He fell back and finished third. He has not had a great career here at Michigan, but he will be back. We anticipate a green flag momentarily. We'll take a quick timeout and return for more live from Michigan. Get ready for the start of the U.S. 500. Back live at Michigan, you ride with Bobby Rahal as the field reassembles for our second attempt to start the inaugural running of the U.S. 500 about 60 minutes after the original start was aborted due to a heavy crash. The cars, with the exception of Adrian Fernandez, are now back out on the racetrack, several drivers in backup cars. With that, let's take another look at our Miller starting grid in anticipation of a green flag here at Michigan. Reassembled the front row of Jimmy Vassar and Brian Herda. Adrian Fernandez is out for the moment, but as you may have heard a few moments ago, he intends to get back into the race. Row two, Alex Zanardi of Italy. Al Unzer Jr., holder of the fastest ever 500 lap race, 500 mile race, a lap speed of 189.7 miles an hour. And Andre Ribeiro, the winner in Rio earlier this year. Paul Tracy, Emerson Fittipaldi, and Scott Pruitt make up row three. On row four, Raul Buesel. Michael Andretti and Christian Fittipaldi. Andretti, a two-time winner here at Michigan in 500-mile competition. Back on row number five, Gilda Ferran, Mauricio Gujamin, and Bobby Rahal. On row number six, Parker Johnstone, Greg Moore, and Eddie Lawson, the four-time World 500cc motorcycle road racing champion. On row number seven, Mark Blondell, Roberto Moreno, and Robbie Gordon. On row eight, Stefan Johansson, fellow Swede Frederick Ekblom, and Jeff Krosnoff. On row nine, Hiro Matsushita, Juan Fangio II for Dan Gurney's All-American Racers, and Gary Bettenhausen racing for brother Tony in the Alumax Penske with Mercedes-Benz power. Now the cars begin to form the three wide rows. Each man certainly sobered by the experience of that crash, perhaps a little wiser. It'll be interesting to see who makes adjustments for the restart. Toyota Pace car has pulled away. The field is under the control of Jimmy Vassar, and there's a lot of spacing there between the first couple of rows. Brian Herta dropping well back. We'll see if Jim Swintall gives them the green flag this time around. He does, and Jimmy Vassar will have a huge lead as the U.S. 500 gets underway. His teammate Alex Zanardi slots into the second spot as they power into turn one for the first time. Well, Jimmy certainly didn't want anything to do with competitors being beside him in the beginning of that event. You can certainly see he was on the gas in turns three and four, and he's got about a quarter distance down the back straight lead right now. An act of courage for all of these drivers. After frantic repairs to these cars, they're out there with the power down. Brian Hurd is dropping back through the field as you watch Vassar in the bright red Target Ganassi Racing Reynard Honda with Firestone tires launching himself around. Well, certainly Brian might have had a few changes on his car, obviously. I'm not quite sure if he's in a spare car, but for sure he wants to feel the car out. Maybe there's something going on there that he's not quite comfortable with right now because he's certainly not on the gas like his other colleagues. We get a look at Alan Zer Jr. presently running in third position behind the teammates Vassar and Zanardi. Zer Jr speed of 189 miles an hour back in the early 90s winning the fastest 500 mile race of all time and there's the man he battled to the line in last year's Marlboro 500 call that race Allen's or junior passed Pruitt going on to the white flag lap Pruitt came around in turns three and four to take the second closest IndyCar finish of all time and first victory for Firestone tires in a 500 mile race Side by side racing here. Michael's car is working real, real well. You can see him go high or low anywhere he wants. And Pruitt's blown an engine very early on. It's only a few laps into the event. And I'm sure that's an engine that's let go. And it was just as he passed the pit in. He's got it down low off the racing line. We have a yellow flag all the way around the racetrack. 
as you see Scott Pruitt rolling to a stop with that Ford XD engine expired. They'll pull on to the pit exit. And that's a big disappointment for the last man to win a 500 mile race here at Michigan. And Scott was also the fastest man in warm up yesterday running at 232 miles an hour so he had a great opportunity to win here today. James Allen is with his car owner Pat Patrick. Actually with uh, Jim McGee in fact Bob Jim what's the story with uh, Scott look like a blown engine. Yeah he said the uh, car was fine and everything just bang you know so uh, tough day because uh, we had a great car you know with Firestones and you know everything was going our way and uh, we got through the wreck all right but it just seems that uh, sometimes fate uh, deals you funny w in funny ways so uh, it's a tough deal. Jim McGee the calmest man in IndyCar racing always says I never let anything spoil my day. Back to you boys. And that perhaps helps explain as you watch Scott Pruitt making the long walk back to his pits. Jim McGee the most effective team manager of all time in IndyCar racing with more than 80 individual victories. Now there you see the newest rule in IndyCar going into effect. The pits are closed while the, the cars queue up behind the safety vehicle. And when they are open first the lead lap cars of course that includes just about everybody will come on in. And then everyone will go back out and we'll get the race back underway as you see the crews working on Scott Pruitt's car looks like that engine pretty comprehensively detonated very early on and that really makes you wonder about uh, longevity sometimes of the equipment and it's a 500 mile event like we talked about you have to be there at the end you have to go 450 miles to get ready to go racing for the last 50 miles or so. the pits are now open there you see the plus sign. Normally deep into the race when we have lap cars out there that would mean that the lead lap cars only could now head for the pits one lap later the lapped cars would be allow in and we would have a double file restart but at this point obviously so early in this race with just four laps complete everyone will be able to pit this time around taking a look at the stream of cars no one taking advantage of the opportunity which I guess says something about the uh, repairs that these mechanics all made to the cars no one coming in to have anything looked at. No and that's great uh, the drivers are going to have a lot of confidence with that for sure. The uh, cars put together very quickly as we talked about a little bit earlier in the show. Quick couple of notes here I see that Ray Hall who started 15th is all the way up to 7th already and uh, Robbie Gordon in the Valvoline car who started back in 21st is uh, all the way up to about 9th. So uh, these guys are really moving up quite quickly and maybe the experience is paying off here to get through the field in the first couple of laps. We saw the top five. Paul Tracy runs sixth, Bobby Rahal seventh, Brian Herta eighth, Robbie Gordon ninth, Andre Ribeiro tenth, followed by Gilles Deferrin and Raul Bueso. And here's a replay of the blown engine for Scott Pruitt. Oh yeah. Just sound the engine's getting tight you can hear it just before you see the puff of smoke and uh, Michael got a good run on going into turn three so the motor was probably starting to slow up on just a little bit at that point in time. It all happens so very very quickly at 230 miles an hour. That's the car to your right of your screen. The plume of smoke says it all. Scott Pruitt's race was run virtually before it began. And there is Scott. We spent a full year testing Firestone tires before getting back into active competition with Pat Patrick's team. There you see the field summary through 15 positions after four laps. Quickly, let's hear from Jan Bikas. Just a quick update on Scott Goodyear's car, of course, the one he would be driving, and that's Frederick Eckblum. He is out there at the moment in the other Valvoline car, in fact, Robbie Gordon's spare car. So if you see two Valvoline cars out there identically painted, make sure you check for the helmet and for the number 15 as opposed to the five. He did not have his spare ready, so he hopped into Robbie's. Let's go to Marty Reed. Thanks, Jan. Brian Hurt's problem may be in the boost, but the team can't really figure it out because they're having radio communication problems with Brian. So they're still looking at all the data, trying to figure out, but right now he's running in eighth, guys. All right, thanks, gentlemen. Adrian Fernandez's car has been pulled back from the pit lane. I'm not sure if we'll see Adrian back in competition or not. Meanwhile, up front, there is Jimmy Vassar, Alex Zanardi just behind him, then Alanzer Jr. Emerson Fittipaldi runs fourth and Michael Andretti in fifth. There is Adrian Fernandez. It appears that his race will not happen today either. Now under the new pit lane regulations 
and have been confirmed for this race only on an experimental basis. Afterward, the IndyCar board and technical committees will review to see if they want to use them at other events. There is no passing until we reach the start-finish line, and the race leader will bring the field down. Here comes Jimmy Vassar. Now, there's Michael Andretti, I believe, getting down low under Emerson Fittipaldi. Got a great toe on him going into turn one and a good run. If he can pick up a draft from the car just in front of him, which is Allens or Jr., he'll get a good run going on down to turn three. Michael being very aggressive, wants to get up to the front right away and not let those Honda powered cars get too far ahead of him. Goes underneath Allens or Jr. Two men have been racing each other for a long time. Two of the elder statesmen, if that's possible to believe in IndyCar racing, Unzer Jr. in his 15th season. Paul Tracy having a look under Bobby Rahal as they come up on Emerson Fittipaldi. Some great side-by-side -side action here at 230 miles an hour. All these guys trusting each other very, very much. And there again, as we talked about, keeping in front of the guys that uh, they really want to make sure that they get a good draft going into the turn. These guys have been sitting around for about an hour, and they certainly want to get up to speed quite quickly and not let those leaders get away. Another look there on the left of your screen. Andretti and Unzer running together, tied for the lead among active drivers in all-time IndyCar victories with 31. There's Paul Tracy on the left, on the right, Brian Herta. This track lends itself to such incredible speed. We saw practice speeds of 235 miles an hour or more. And of course, that means they're going even faster on the backstretch. Tremendous stress applied to both the cars and the drivers when they're up on the banking like this. Oh, certainly. The cars are at maximum Gs, probably just over four Gs in total, getting through the bowl, the turn, as we call it, right there in the center of turns three and four. We see there on the deep part shape of the oval right now, going past the start and finish line in turn one and two. And it looks like Al Jr. and Michael Andretti are in for a long day of battling side by side. These guys are running very close to each other. Alonzo Jr. second in points. Michael Andretti sixth coming into this round of the championship. Once again, Andretti goes low. Michael likes that low line. If I can recall, Mario did too when Mario was running. Now Jr. I competed against him many times also here. And uh, also runs a little bit of a higher line. But these guys, the two cars are so even, as you can see. They each get a draft from each other down one end of the straight going into the turn one area, and it seems like Michael's right back down to that yellow line again. Cars working very well for him down low. And this is what the drivers say they like best about Michigan. You can ride side by side, and we have a yellow flag. Problems on the number 15 car. That is Frederick Eckblum in Robbie Gordon's backup machine for Derek Walker Racing. The pits are closed now. The rule is in effect. The pits are closed. And until they are open, Drivers will queue up behind the safety car. Jan Bikas is with Scott Pruitt. Scott, you've made your way now back to the pits. Would you ever have thought coming into the US 500 that it would have started like this? First an accident and an engine going right away. Well, not for us. You know, we've been having a lot of problems with the engines lately. We lost three um, qualifying weekend. You know, it's, uh, I'm not sure, you know, what's going on with them. We seem to have a lot of difficulties right now. Ford's really trying to catch up to the Honda and to the Mercedes. It's just disappointing. I mean, everybody at Patrick and Firestone, you know, we worked so hard. The cars were running so good. Uh, even out there, I mean, we were just, you know, marching up forward and everything was going great. And unfortunately, the engine let loose the three laps. So now, normally at the start of a race, you run a higher gear so you don't spin it so high. So it doesn't seem to be revs that's killing it. No, I mean, I had it in sixth gear right away. I was just and I was breathing at both ends. I mean, I was just getting into the cruise mode, and, uh, you know, just doing time, getting the miles under my belt, waiting for the end. Well, Scott Pruitt is now, unfortunately, just a spectator today. Thanks, Scott. And with it, went Scott Pruitt's shot at a million dollars and the Vanderbilt Cup. There's the running order. Jimmy Vassar leads teammate Alex Zanardi. We'll be back for more live from Michigan. The march to the Stanley Cup continues here on ESPN tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The Detroit Red Wings winning this team in the NHL this year on the verge of elimination at the hands of the Colorado Avalanche. That'll be coming your way tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. And then on Tuesday, May 28th, it's the Florida Panthers against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Once again at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, it's not hockey, it's playoff hockey, and we've got it all here on ESPN. Back live at Michigan, you ride with Brazilian Gilles de Ferran for Jim Hall and the Pennzoil Reynard with Honda Power. Goodyear tires on this machine. 
after Ferran suffered such heartbreak at Long Beach, California earlier this year. He had the race virtually in the bag until he lost a hose off the turbocharger and he could only watch helplessly as Jimmy Vassar ran by to take the victory. Here's a look at our running order after 12 of 250 scheduled laps. Vassar and Zanardi up front. Michael Andretti in third, followed by Al Enzer Jr., Emerson Fittipaldi. There you see the rest of the running order. Jan Bikas has something for us from the pits. We just had an opportunity to talk with Derek Walker and Frederick Eckblum's car was the same situation as Scott Pruitt. The Ford power plant just let go. That was a fresh engine, Derek said. It wasn't one that was used that was in the spare car. Obviously, Derek Walker and the Valvoline team now obviously be very concerned for Robbie Gordon as that was his spare car. He has the same engine. Thanks very much, Jan. Now you see the cars coming back up to speed as we await the green flag. The pace car is off. Jimmy Vassar leads his teammate, Alex Zanardi. Green flag, and we are back underway, working lap number 13. Check that, lap number 15. And once again, Michael Andretti is down low. Michael always gets a good start. It looks like he got a good run off the... Uh, Turn four, restart again, and here he goes. And I think he's slipping underneath Zanardi right now. Uh, what a drive. He started back in uh, about the third or fourth row, right beside his teammate, Christian Fittipaldi. And you can see the Honda Power is just starting to pull off turn four. And Michael's going to get himself caught up in the draft here and hopefully suck himself along and maybe try the lower line again going into turn one. Michael Andretti also using that Ford XD Power. Notice the lack of steering input from the steering wheel. Andretti watches Zanardi disappear on the back straightaway. And this is very hard for a driver because Michael would like to run the fifth gear right now and keep up with the guys that are up in front of him, work for the Honda Power cars. But he also has to get to the end. So that means putting the car in top gear in sixth gear, conserving the revs, conserving fuel, and especially since he knows that two cars have been out of the field so far already in this race, and both of them are identical motors of which he is running. Got about a little bit further back as Robbie Gordon goes underneath Emerson Fittipaldi, taking over seventh spot. And Gilda Ferran coming up as well. Emmo appears to be losing speed on the banking. And he does. Both those guys have moved up quite well from their starting positions. I think Robbie was back in 21st position. And Gilda Ferran, I think, uh, was also back in the teams. Both of them having disappointing qualifying runs. But with the time delay that we had between qualifying and the race here, a lot of cars have found speed over this last week or two. Alex Zanardi passes his teammate Jimmy Vassar, and we have a new leader here at Michigan. You see them running nose to tail. The aerodynamic toe effect, so important on this two mile racetrack. Very, very important. And there again, the Honda power plant is just so dominant on these super speedways. Now it makes you wonder if these guys are both in top gear and sixth gear, or if Jimmy's decided to go ahead and just leave it in top gear, maybe conserve some fuel. It makes you wonder if Zanardi's running in fifth, and you don't know what the orders are from the pits. I'm sure that these guys are all out racing right now and just trying to get pulled away from the guys that are back behind them. Being teammates, these guys would certainly run one and two and run a toe like you see in NASCAR and just leave the pack behind if they could do such a thing. Here's Michael Andretti still showing in third place. His own piece of racetrack right now. Vassar ahead of him, Bobby Ray Hall behind him. 1991 series champion who won his 31st career IndyCar win in our most recent round at Nazareth, Pennsylvania. What better place to win than on your home track? There's Bobby Rahal running in fourth. And we see his teammate, Brian Herta, who started up in the front row, is actually cured any problems that he had on the start or on the restart, if you will. And he's right behind his team owner, Bobby Rahal. Perhaps one of the most comfortable teams with their sponsorship. Little Bird Company recently announced they'd be with Bobby Ray Hall through the turn of the century. Let's get down to pit lane. Jan, what have you got? Well, you guys were just talking about with the two Ganassi cars, were they both running in fifth or sixth gear? I asked that very question of Tom Anderson, the team manager, and he said both of the cars are out there at the moment in sixth gear. All right, thanks, Jan. Look at Gilles de Ferran run. He has gone around Robbie Gordon. That puts him up into the sixth spot. I'm feeling very comfortable with his car, if you can recall. They we changed that, changed that whole rear corner, putting on some new suspension pieces and new uprights, and they're bleeding the brakes. And Gilles obviously has got a lot of confidence in his team, a lot of confidence in his car, because he's just starting to march forward. Here's a guy who has really opened the eyes of racers in Europe to what you can do with the IndyCar Series here in America. Of course, I covered Formula One for ESPN. 
everyone wants to know how Jill DeFerran is doing. But there's a lot of talk about DeFerran going back to Formula One to race with his old team mentor, Jackie Stewart, when he enters Formula One next year. He is very much a man on the boil in auto racing around the world right now. Doing a great job for Jim Hall and Penzoil. Got some great passing going on there. You saw Greg Mueller run the high line through turns one and two, get around the outside of Gilles DeFerrin, and get a good run going down into turn three, and he's actually left Gilles behind a little bit, and he's starting to move further forward and taking a run up towards Robbie Gordon. We have a yellow flag and a debris flag from the flag stand. You see how stiffly the wind is blowing here behind the drivers as they make their way across the start finish line. That will certainly add some revs as they head down into turn one. Ride with Robbie Gordon as he slows down. Marty Reed has more on Emerson Fittipaldi's situation. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, these guys have got a big smile on their face. Their car had gone really loose, and they are now going to be able to benefit from this yellow bringing him in without going down a lap. I don't think I've seen Carl Hogan smile this big in a long time. Thanks very much, Marty. There is the debris on the racetrack. Boy, at these speeds, are drivers able to pick up something that small, Scott? Well, you certainly can if you can actually see it if you're coming out of a turn looking down the straight. But the key thing here is that if you get into the turn one or three and you're going so fast and the debris further around the turn like it is here in turn two, very hard and very difficult to pick up. We ride with Christian Fittipaldi who has made a pit stop. I don't believe the pits were open there. You see the plus, the plus sign meaning that the pits are now open. But Christian came in while they were closed. Now, if it wasn't an emergency stop, he may find himself in a penalty situation. But as it is, he will have to make, to make his way around to the back of the line. And that could become a factor later in the race. Now the pits are open. Here come the cars. Once again, virtually everybody running on the lead lap. So everyone will pick. Now, the key thing to watch here is the order as they come in is Zanardi, Vassar, and Michael Andretti. Which team is going to have the fastest stop here and get their guy out in the lead? Although it may not be of great importance right now, it certainly will be as soon as the guys get towards the end of the race and you're looking for any advantage you can get, whether it's on the track or in the pits. Jimmy Vassar, with glasses on under his visor, appears to be done and out, and we've got lots of cars leading now. Andre Ribeiro right out there by the wall. Michael Andretti has stalled and refired now in the pits. That's not the first time that's happened to him this year. Well, he stalled at Nazareth and came back and won the race, so uh, maybe this might be an omen here today. He's lost some positions, though. You see him coming out behind Emerson Fittipaldi. Michael pitted from third spot. He has a number of positions behind that back now as everyone gets back out. Pit lane is clear once again. We have four different safety cars in operation today, representing the four different engine manufacturers in IndyCar, Mercedes-Benz, Toyota, Honda, and Ford. You see the numbers on Michael Andretti. We'll have the green flag in just a moment. After this word, we'll be back with more live from Michigan. Alex Zanardi now up front. ESPN Speed World coverage of the inaugural US 500 is brought to you by Mobile Motor Oil. At Mobile, we've been changing oil for over 125 years. By the more than 1,300 AutoZone stores across America. AutoZone, the best parts in auto parts. And by Budweiser, official sponsor of the 1996 US Olympic team. This Bud's for you. Welcome back to Michigan. Bob Varsha along with Scott Goodyear, James Allen, Marty Reed, and Jan Bikas. Glad to have you with us on this Memorial Day weekend. You ride with Robbie Gordon as we await the green flag for a restart following a yellow brought out by Debris on the track. Now Christian Fittipaldi pitted before the pits were open and ran over his air hose, so he will be penalized by a drive through of the pit lane. And at the 80 mile an hour pit speed, you can imagine that will cost him some time. Now we're having our first Double file start. Gary Bettenhausen leads the slower cars down on the inside, while the race leader, Mauricio Gugelmin, leads the cars on the lead lap. Down to the start they come in good order. And Roberto Moreno attacks immediately to go around Gugelmin. Uh, some great drafting going on in the restart there. Roberto just sat back, got a good toe. He's using the XB engine, not the most powerful engine that's out there, but he got a good toe and a good shot right up towards the front. A veteran, one of the most personable guys in racing. 
visited Monaco with him for the Formula One race. He took us around town, showed us all the sights. And now here he is, 10 years after his last appearance on the high banks of Michigan. He drove a March Fort Cosworth back then. Here he is rocketing around for Peyton Coyne Racing, and he has the lead in the inaugural U.S. 500. I'm sure this is a thrill for Dale Coyne and Walter Payton. Both those guys called me when I was in the hospital in Brazil, and Walter Payton gave me some great advice. He said, I've had a lot of injuries in my football career, and the ones that I've let rest have never haunted me again. The ones I've rushed are still with me today. Ward 17 battling over third place. That's Alex Zanardi dueling with Mauricio Gujalmi. Now Gujalmi comes up behind Roberto Moreno. Christian Fittipaldi has served his drive through penalty. He's back on the racetrack. Mauricio Gujami took a little time to get up to speed, but now he appears to be at full tilt. He sure does. I think in the background there, I see one of the target Honda cars starting to work their way back up through the uh, through the group of the guys that did not pit like Marino and Gujamin and Blundell. It's probably Alex Zanardi who did come in and get his car serviced in that last yellow. So he's at a bit of an advantage right now. At the top of your screen, you see the information being provided to us from our friends at EDS, the laps remaining, the gaps between the various cars and the running order. There you see Roberto Moreno onto the back stretch, launching down, following in the toe as the car is snaked down at top speed in excess of 240 miles an hour. Jan Bikas. I have a quick update for you on the Ganassi situation because both Alex Zanardi and Jimmy Vassar came in at the same time. Jimmy Vassar actually had a faster pit stop, but then he killed the engine. That allowed Zanardi to get out first, and as you've said, Zanardi now right now working quickly through the field. Zanardi took a look under Roberto Moreno, and he drops back in the line as they come rocketing off the high banks onto the flat back straightaway. And hovering right behind Zanardi is rookie Greg Moore, who's doing just a great job. And I think his team got him in and out of the pits the quickest, because when we came back to green, I think it was Greg Muir that actually led the guys that had pitted. So obviously he got in and out of the pits quite quickly. His team serves his car maybe a little quicker than the two target cars. Once again, Zanardi goes underneath, but can't get it done. The running order is Gujelman. This battle, Moreno and Zanardi, then Greg Moore, then Jimmy Vassar rounding out the top five. Mark Blundell, Gilles DeFerran, Bobby Rahal, Andre Ribeiro, and Robbie Gordon round out your top ten. And Brian Herta, Eddie Lawson, Michael Andretti back in 13th. Jeff Krosnoff and Raul Boiso. As Zanardi got a great toe from Roberto Marino and just slipped on the underneath side of him going into three. You say Greg Moore is doing the same. Just getting a toe in the deep portion of the oval, running along the high side, going through turns one and two. Tiro Matsushita moving very slowly down to the inside. He had a long pit stop. He was running well behind the field at this point. You watch Roberto Moreno of Brazil with data control Lola for Cosworth XB. From the flag stand, cars flash by. 225, 230 miles an hour. As you look at Greg Moore, there's Moreno, and then Vassar. comes up on Moreno for fourth. The track is so wide and so smooth. Gives the drivers a lot of room to maneuver. Zanardi rushes up in the toe behind race leader Mauricio Gujamin and passes him to the low side. A nice clean pass about five or eight miles an hour faster going into turn one. Makes you wonder if it's like on the power along with getting a good draft going into the turn. Jan Bikas in the pits. While you're looking at Mauricio Guzman, I can tell you that judging by what we can see, how many laps they've run, everyone here on pit road thinks that you can't run more than 38 to 40 laps. He just gets passed by Greg Moore, but he will have to slide down into pit lane in less than five laps. At the moment, we're working lap number 37. They say 38 to 40 is about all you can do, but of course, you have to add in a little for the yellow flag period. Thanks very much, Jan. There you see the lap time comparisons for Greg Moore. Lap speeds, I should say. Tremendous speed. 
Calling for the utmost in concentration. Here's our EDS timing and scoring. Guzman and Zanardi. Now Guzman about to come under fire from Jimmy Vassar. And that would be for third place. All these guys knowing they've got a long race to run. Sit back, pick your time, don't get too excited. Don't find yourself on the high side of a competitor when you're coming out of the turns, either two or four, and get pinched against the wall. That's the danger zones that are around here. Sometimes a car can be trying to pass you and be up in the blind spot, run you high up into the gray, into the wall. A little bit too early to be taking any chances like that at this time. Here comes Vassar on the high side, then he ducks out of it. Well, no sooner said than done, and that's the key thing. And Jimmy's very smart. He'll just sit back and take another run out of here. Got a slow car in the backstretch. Maybe Raul Boisel's car, the Brahma Sports. Ford powered Reynard. Raul slowed down after that very first uh, yellow. He's back about 15th spot right now. It looks like he's going to head into the pits to get some service. And with Gilles de Ferran, presently shown in sixth spot. This leader Zanardi on the left. The 17 car of Mauricio Gujamin is slowing. That's his teammate Mark Blundell going by him. Blundell running fifth right now. The best runs he's had thus far in his very young IndyCar career. And the Ferran moves up behind Gujamin. No question, Gujamin is slowing. The Ferran just blows by him on the banking. There's Emerson Fittipaldi's car in the pits. Looks like the electric can leave the same tires on the car and get a wing adjustment on the front. So the crew man up the front making an adjustment on the car, filling it up with 40 gallons of methanol. Emerson's obviously happy with the set of tires that are on the car. The key thing here is that when you go back out, the tires are warm, you get right up to speed right away, no having to wait for a lap or two to build the heat up in the tires. Look at Alex Zanardi. Italian who started so strongly in IndyCar this year. He lost a wheel off the car in Miami and that led him to crash. Took the pole at Rio. And has run strongly everywhere. This is his first visit to a super speedway oval. He is doing really well. And there's Christian Fittipaldi. Meanwhile, Marty Reed has more on Emerson Fittipaldi's reason for pinning. Guys, obviously there was another problem because when he came in the first time, remember we were talking about how happy they were, they put two full turns in the front wing, so obviously the uh, second adjustment was needed because he was dropping back badly. Also, can tell you about Al Unser Jr., he fell way back and he's still struggling. He lost the wicker bill. It is literally gone, and they're hoping to make it without getting lapped to the next pit stop. Thanks, Marty. Based on what we've seen thus far, that next pit stop may not be too far away. You wrote briefly with Christian Fittipaldi, and as you saw, that pit penalty for running over the air hose dropped him back to 20th spot. We'll be back with more live from the inaugural running of the U.S. 500 at Michigan. There you see the order. There is the Vanderbilt Trophy, first introduced in 1904 by William K. Vanderbilt to attract the best drivers and cars in the world to America, and it was eminently successful. It was no longer awarded in the late 1930s, but now in 1996, it is back. Three feet tall, holds 10.5 gallons of champagne, I am told. We'll find out later today when someone wins the inaugural running of the U.S. 500. Bob Varsha, along with Scott Goodyear, glad to have you with us. There is Juan Manuel Fangio II, who slowed on the backstretch with that Toyota-powered all-American Racers Eagle Mark V chassis, and this was the problem on the backstretch as Fangio slowed, put his arm in the air, and everyone took evasive action. It appears he lost the drive. Marty Reed, what can you tell us? As far as Fangio's concerned, they've got an electrical problem, so they're, we're hoping he was going to make it back in, but obviously that's not going to be the case. You know, Dan Gurney said that this was going to be a character-building year. At the rate they're going, he's just one step below the Pope right now. Well, the folks from All-American Racers and Toyota will tell you they are developing the entire engine and chassis combination. Here at Michigan, we have 49 laps complete. We are under a yellow. The pits are now open. The lead lap cars will be allowed to pit. And then the lapped machines. Our EDS timing and scoring shows 17 cars on the lead lap. 
last two cars in that line Alonzer Jr. and Paul Tracy in the Marlboro Penske Mercedes Benz machines you ride with Robbie Gordon. There is the Ganassi crew preparing for the arrival we are told of Jimmy Vassar shown in third place right now his teammate Alex Zanardi leads. In fact it appears that both of the Ganassi cars will head for the pits. There is Zanardi. And the key thing that happened here last time was with the two target cars side by side in the pit lane. I think they might have slowed each other up trying to get out. That allowed Greg Moore to have a clean stop. Leave the pits and off we see him go. Making some wing adjustments on Jimmy Vassar's car. Looks like they were adding more wing into the front of the car. So obviously running an understeer situation. Maybe the car not turning as well as he needed it to down in the turns. James Allen can add something. Yes, Greg Moore just came in and it, he didn't make any adjustment whatsoever to the wing of his car. He's very happy with it. In fact, he's so happy with it, he wants to press on and attack the leader. But his team has told him to play it cool. There's an awful long way to go. Paul Tracy had two turns of front wing. He's got a massive oversteer problem at the moment, and he's still very unhappy with it. And uh, on the Michael Andretti front, well, think about Nazareth, guys. He stalled in the pit lane, but then again, he went on to win the race. Michael Andretti's still in the hunt. Thanks, James. From high overhead, the Budweiser blimp is joining us today over the U.S. 500. The Bud One travels the country as the aerial ambassador for Anheuser-Busch. And we're glad to have them with us on this historic day. Ooh, that looked really close. Crowded skies over Michigan International Speedway. There is Michael Andretti, presently shown in the fourth spot. The pits are now open for the lapped cars. There is Christian Fittipaldi with the Newman Haas car. His uncle Emerson, the Hogan Penske machine, and Marlboro Latin America and Mobile One colors are out. And so is Christian. Back into the pit lane, 80 mile an hour speed limit before rejoining the two mile oval. The Baldy running on Goodyear tires. Goodyear tires, when everybody leaves the pits, Goodyear or Firestone, it's a little bit cold here today, about 55, 60 degrees. Temperatures are a little chilly for the tires. So when the guys are leaving the pits, they want to make sure that the cars are going to get warmed up with their tire temperatures so they don't have any problems like we saw in the restart. Now this was the crash that opened our day here at Michigan as Jimmy Vassar and Adrian Fernandez got together. Complete chaos resulted. Approximately 12 cars involved. Fortunately, no one hurt. And perhaps most miraculously of all, virtually every car saved one, that of Adrian Fernandez who was on the front row and made the initial contact with Jimmy Vassar right there. There is Fernandez. They were unable to get that car or its backup into the race for the Mexican driver. There's Brian Hurta's car, perhaps the single most damaged machine as he was pinched up against that wall. And this look as they approach. Vassar down low, Fernandez next to him on the front row. You'll see a puff of smoke right there. And then it's an all skate. You see the guys in the second row really have nowhere to go. No chance to save the car. Traveling at that speed. All you can do is hope that you get through the debris. You see Raul Buesel's car in the Brahma sports team pit. The defending team champions in IndyCar. The stewardship of Barry Green, his brother Kim. They allowed me to sit in that car a day or so ago and it was remarkable to me to sit there and see the tremendous field of view that these drivers have and how close those front wheels are to the driver compartment. James Allen has something for us from the pits. Yeah it seems Robbie Gordon had a very strange uh, incident. He came in for a stop but he was too far away from the pit wall for the fuel hose to reach so he had to go back out again without having taken on any more fuel. I'll follow that up for you guys. Now we have our double file restart. Alex Zanardi up high leading the cars on the lead lap. The pace car has not come in so it appears that we will get one more lap. Yes we have the crossed green and yellow flags right there. And that means there will be one lap to green. Keep in mind these drivers reacting to these double file restarts and various pit rule changes for the first time and thus far things have gone very very well. Jan Bikas. Just a quick update on the Target Ganassi team when they came in to make their stop. Scott Goodyear, you called it right on. You watched the front wing adjustments on both of the cars. Jimmy Vassar got one turn of wing. He had quite a bit of push. 
Alex Sonardi, on the other hand, had only half a turn away. So at the moment, Sonardi, not quite as much push, but now they seem as though they're equalized. And thanks, Jan, as we get set for the restart. Let's talk about the mechanical lineup. And it is diverse. Up front, we have a Honda Lola on Firestone tires, a Mercedes Reynard on Firestones, a Honda Lola again on Firestones. Those are the Zanardi and Vassar cars, and a Ford Cosworth with Goodyear's and a Honda Lola on Firestones. Goodyear, in fact, has produced over 30,000 tires for the various worldwide racing activities of that giant company. It has been a very busy month of May for them. Now, Alex Zanotti gets a great run off the corner. Greg Moore is going to have to hustle to catch him, and he won't do it as they flash across the start-finish line. In fact, Jimmy Vassar right there behind Moore. Jimmy trying to get a toe on Greg to get underneath or around the top of him in turns one and two. We heard from the pit reporters earlier on that Greg wants to go after the leaders, but there's no need to do that right now. We're just one-fifth of the way into the race. Got a long ways to go. Best thing to do, and it's hard to do when you're here for the very first time, is to sit back for 450 miles, get the car working perfectly for you, get good clean pit stops, keep away from any debris on the racetrack, and be there to get ready to go racing for that last, most important 50 miles. Rick Moore had a terrific race in our most recent round at Nazareth, Pennsylvania, as you watch Andre Ribeiro, winner of the debut of the Indy cars in Rio de Janeiro earlier this year. He is closing up. Remember, Ribeiro also took a hard lick in the wall in that crash before the green flag. The crew has his backup out there, and it's running very well. There's Michael Andretti down low. Bobby Rahal up high. Rahal shown in sixth spot. Andretti in eighth. He must be seventh now, so they have dealt with Jill de Ferran. Andretti right up behind Rahal as the two veterans come down to the start-finish line. And Michael going to that Andretti low line. As we talked about a little bit earlier, Mario always liked it down there. Ray Hall running in the middle of the track. And now it's going to be a race down to turn three. Just horsepower is going to play the part here. Zanardi going down underneath Jimmy Vassar. Excuse me, Ribeiro. I beg your pardon. That's for third place. Cars still tightly bunched. Imagine the turbulence from the driver's cockpit with that many cars running that close together at these speeds. Greg Moore up high. Vassar chooses to stay low. Ribeiro behind him. Behind Ribeiro, Mark Blundell, the Englishman, over from Formula One, continuing to have a great run here today. And there goes Andretti underneath Rahal. That will put Michael up into the sixth spot, demoting Bobby Rahal to seventh. And this is a great time when you're competing like this, and you trust the guy that's beside you. You can run high, you can run low. And as we talked about, there's quite a few cars here in the mix. Key thing you do when you turn into a turn is try and look for some clean air. Let the air in front of you just make sure it's nice and clean, non-disturbed as we call it. You don't want any turbulent air coming off the cars in front of you when you're in the turns. That's the opposite of what you're looking for when you're going down the straight because you want to run in the draft of the car in front of you so you can get a real good run on the competitor up in front and slipstream past him. Hall looking ahead to Michael Andretti's car as they go under the flag stand. Meanwhile, here's Robbie Gordon. Gordon shown in the 12 spot. He closes up on Mauricio Gujelmin for 11th. Make it look so easy. That was a nice move by Robbie. He snuck underneath some wheel to wheel competition and he just pushed Mauricio just up in the upper line and he took the air away from him as he exited turn two. Good example there, more aerodynamics. You saw Gujami slip out of the slipstream and Roberto Romano immediately closed up on him. And that allows Robbie Gordon a little breathing room. He tries to work his way back up to the top ten. Marketing just that little bit in the afternoon here in Michigan. Plenty more still to come from the inaugural running of the U.S. 500. Stay with us. Back live at Michigan, there is Greg Moore, the spectacular Canadian rookie, presently in third spot. Just behind him, Andre Ribeiro of Brazil. Lots of cars still running nose to tail for position here in Michigan. Greg Moore using that new Mercedes engine, which has been updated a little bit since the beginning of the year. Being chased by Andre Ribeiro and the Honda power plant. 
Jan Bikas can add to the situation. Well, the interesting thing about both those two cars, with Moore and Andre Ribeiro, of course, they're on Firestone tires, but both of those cars are on the primary compound. The Target Ganassi team is on the option, but they have gone with the primary. It's a driver feel situation. They feel their drivers like it better, and as you can see, there's very little difference in lap time. It looks as though the primary could, however, be a bit more durable. We haven't talked much about the tire situation, the selection of compounds. The tire war, if you want to call it that, between Goodyear and Firestone has been remarkable for its good sportsmanship. There's been no suggestion that the tires are anything less than of absolute integrity. The teams have several choices of compound and of stagger as well. The natural difference between the circumference of the right and left side tires that makes the car want to turn left. And the stagger is most important if the track's going to get very, very hot and greasy, but we got cool conditions here today. So I'd have to say that we can maybe run a one constant stagger all day long as we look at Michael Andretti is slowing down. Oh, what a disappointment as the cars go rocketing by. He was in sixth position. And Bob, we talked about this earlier as we see a little flame coming out the back of the car. Michael running with that Ford XD engine. We've seen a couple of them go a little bit earlier and you can see the flame coming out the back. Right there at the upright, he's also got some flame where the half shaft enters the gearbox. Jan Bikas. Well, we're standing down here in the Newman Haas, and they're doing the same thing that we are. They are looking at the monitor to try and find out exactly what happens. We are going to try and get in and get the information. Of course, we feel at the moment it might be engine, but we don't want to speculate. We'll get back with you with the exact cause in a moment. There you see Mario Andretti. If you were with us for our coverage of qualifying, you recall he made some laps of this racetrack in a close group of cars carrying an IMAX movie camera in preparation for a movie about the art and science of IndyCar racing scheduled to debut next spring. Mario said he has had a tremendous time driving that camera car. It looked pretty racy in it, if I do say so myself. There's Alex Zanardi having a spectacular day, running in first position. He is the overall lap leader, and there is a bonus point to be awarded for the driver who leads the most laps in the race. His teammate, Jimmy Vassar, took pole for this race, picking up a bonus point, which put him 21 points ahead of the second man in points coming in, as you look at Vassar. That is uh, Allenzer Jr. A 21-point gap separates them, so no matter what happens, Vassar is assured of nothing worse than a tie for the points lead when day is done. Now, there is Andre Ribeiro, who's been chasing Greg Moore, and he's finally got him, it would appear, for third place. Using slower traffic to force Moore behind him. It's Emerson Fittipaldi in the red car up high. Now Moore counterattacks. Meanwhile, Allenzer Jr. is in the pits and James Allen is there. Yeah, Allenzer Jr. making another stop. Last time he came in, he took a couple of turns. Unhappy as, have, as was Paul Tracy earlier on with an oversteer problem. This time, obviously, no problems at all. No adjustment to the front wing and Al Jr. is back in the race. Thank you, James. Now the battle has cooled just a bit between Andre Ribeiro on the left. Greg Moore on the right. Moore in his very first super speedway start. The youngest driver ever to win an IndyCar sanctioned event when he won the Indy Lights race on the mile at Phoenix in 1992 at the age of 18. He's done a great job in winter testing, a great job in the first few races this year. And I'm sure we're going to see Greg win an event before the year is over. No question about that. You saw Michael Andretti standing by. Jan Bikas. We check with the crew and they feel that in fact it wasn't an engine, they feel that it was a half shaft. They feel the right rear half shaft or the CV joint to be more specific. Part of the drivetrain was what failed with Michael Andretti. All right, thanks, Jan. Disappointment for a two-time winner in 500-mile competition here at Michigan. Meanwhile, there is Greg Moore, player-sponsored Reynard. Absolutely brimming with confidence. He simply wants to go racing. And after watching him work the traffic on the mile at Nazareth, I'm with you. He's going to win a race very soon. Very confident. Very sure of himself. Comes with all the winter testing that he's done. They got a good team behind him, good sponsorship. And he comes off a season of winning more Indy Lights races than any, anybody else in the past. He's done just a great job all year long. And I'm sure he'll be standing, as we mentioned, the center position on the podium before the year is over. There is Gilles de Ferran. He is in sixth position right now. And here comes Brian Herta being followed by his team owner and teammate, Bobby Rahal. 
the only owner driver in IndyCar competition. This is for seventh place. The two teammates going at it for position as you ride with Ray Hall in the Miller car. Roman Susta just disappeared from your screen. He continues to lap at a sharply reduced pace. On to the back stretch. This is a great shot. When you think about the speed the cars turn at this particular track, they go the length of a football field in less than a second. That will get you to work very quickly in the morning. Now does Robbie Gordon have a problem? He's down to the inside. You see the cars going by. Well, if he was coming in the pits, he'd run a little bit stronger, a little bit harder into turn three than what we see right here. Once again, this is another of the Ford-powered cars. I don't want to speculate on what the problem might be, but we've watched Scott Pruitt and some of the other Ford-powered cars drop out. Jan Bikas, what do we know? Tell you that as far as the Ford Cosworth engineers, they feel it's the alternator. Of course, they have telemetry. They can read those type of things. So Robbie Gordon, if he can make it back, yes, here he is. Robbie Gordon comes to a stop. They are going to try and change. Well, they can't change an alternator. They don't have time, but maybe they can do it with the battery or change some of the other electrics underneath the cowling. But I would have to say it's going to be a long stop for Robbie Gordon. When you consider that the engines go through 2.2 million individual piston strokes during the course of a 500 mile race, you get some idea of how heavily stressed the machinery is. There for second place, Jimmy Vassar and Andre Ribeiro running very close together. Ribeiro, can he get in? Coming out of the backstretch? No, he slips back into the toe, looks for another shot at the reigning points leader in IndyCar competition, Jimmy Vassar, winner of three of the first five races this year. In fact, he won three of the first four, the first driver since Mario Andretti in 1985 to accomplish that feat. And you see their relative speeds. So Ribeiro is definitely closed up. He's moving along at a much, a much bigger clip. You can see the different lines those two drivers are taking. Faster being able to run more of a bowl line going through turns one and two. Ribeiro using up a little bit more racetrack as we call it, running a high, low, high line. High on the entrance, getting low in the center, trying to get a run off the turn, and running high on the exit. Two very similar cars. Reynards with Honda Power and Firestone Tire. The battle is for second. We'll be back with more from Michigan after these words. High overhead with the help of our Honda Helicam. This is the battle for second place. The red car is Jimmy Vassar. The car on the right in black with the yellow nose is Andre Ribeiro coming up on slower traffic. Now both those cars will be feeling a little bit of disturbed air from the car up in front. As we saw down the back stretch. Vassar getting just a little bit of a toe as we see is happening here now and he'll want to get a good clean run going high into turn one. We have action down in turn four. A car up against the wall. I believe that's Gary Bettenhausen. Who made his return to this series for the first time since the Indy 500 in 1993. Driving a 1994 Penske chassis with contemporary Mercedes-Benz V8 power. And as you can see, he has made hard contact with the right side. And did a great job, though, keeping it up on the high line, up against the wall, so he didn't catch any of the other oncoming traffic to come along and take him further out. Ironic that one of the great names in Indianapolis history is here at Michigan this weekend. And his experience showed in the way he handled that incident. He had just 18 laps in the car due to various mechanical difficulties, including his qualifying laps. And there you see Gary sitting in the machine waiting for help. Fluid from the right side radiators. That will take some cleanup. Stable mate to Stefan Johansson, the Alumax sponsored Bettenhausen Motorsports team. It's like it might be getting a little warm in there. <laughs> and so we have a yellow flag all the way around Michigan International Speedway. The pits are closed. All of the teams keeping close tabs on their pit stop schedule have had plenty of opportunity to work on their cars. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see too many cars into the pits this time around. Oh, I'm certain we will. We are coming up to 35 laps since the last yellow and the window somewhere around 38 to 42. So this is going to play into the hands of just about everybody up and down pit road right now. 
I'm going to have to have a talk with you about how you're supposed to support your booth mate at times like this. <laughs> but I'm sure you're right. We expect that pit action, and we'll have it for you shortly. At this point, however, the pits remain closed until the field lines up behind the safety car. We'll be back in a moment. Memorial Day here in America is a time for remembrances. And this weekend, we remember a man whose passion for his sport cost him his life. Scott Brayton, a son of Michigan from the nearby town of Coldwater, died in a practice crash at Indianapolis eight days ago, but not before putting his car on pole for the second year running, forever on pole at Indianapolis. That's the way we will all remember Scott Brayton. Welcome back to Michigan. You ride with Jill Ferran as the pits are now open. Pit activity continues. I'm Bob Varsha along with Scott Goodyear, James Allen, Marty Reed, and Jan Bikas are in the pits as our live coverage continues of the inaugural running of the US 500. The lead lap cars coming around. 11 cars shown on the lead lap with 87 laps complete as we look at our race summary. Alex Zanardi leads for the target Ganassi racing team. Average speed of the event thus far, 166 miles an hour. Keep in mind, we had two starts for this race. Five leaders, four lead changes, five cautions, including one red flag at the beginning of the day for a spectacular crash that caused a full restart. Five cars out of the race. Here they are. Scott Pruitt exploded an engine. Frederick Eckblom, Raul Boisel, Michael Andretti, and Gary Bettenhausen. <laughs> was Gary Bettenhausen's dramatic exit from the race. And I suspect that's the last time we'll see that vantage point on the racetrack. But he held it up against the wall, as a racer should. And Marty Reed has more on Gary's situation. Yeah, guys, the team uh, called in uh, to him, and he reported that the right front tire went down on him, and that's what drifted him up to the wall. He's okay, at least that's what he said to the uh, to the uh, crew, but uh, of course uh, the safety officials will take him back for the mandatory checkup. And Jan, what do you got? Well, I have an update on what's happening down here in the Ganassi pit. There was a lot of changes being made both to Alex Zanardi and to Jimmy Vassar. Jimmy Vassar said his car was unstable, so they changed the rear wicker bill, put more downforce there, and raised the front wing. So more overall downforce for Jimmy Vassar. Alex Zanardi, on the other hand, was fairly happy. They just made a small adjustment with the tire pressures but the only thing was a big concern. He did just barely brush one of Vassar's tires when he was leaving the pits, but IndyCar said, no, just a brush. He didn't run over everything. There's not going to be a penalty. Let's go down to James Allen. A miserable day for Penske's at the moment. They're both Paul Tracy and Alan Sir Jr. have been suffering some, some quite bad handling problems. Tracy's been twisting his wing one way and the other, and he just came over the radio a second ago to say he just cannot live with Zanardi. Now, I don't know whether Penske's have had to uh, keep the rev limit on their Mercedes engines. I know some of the Ford runners had to do that. Honda certainly don't. You can just see the power of those Honda engines. They'll be able to rev right up to the maximum of their band, and everybody else just seems to be watching and just wishing they had a Honda engine right now. Well, keep in mind, you can't rev to the top of your rev range long and expect to last 500 miles. Honda, no question, the leader in the horsepower wars, up around 900 ponies in each of the Honda-powered cars. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Michigan. We remain under a yellow flag. We expect a double-file restart shortly. We ride with Christian Fittipaldi. Much reduced revs from what we see at these cars at top speeds, touching at 230 miles an hour around this two-mile D-shaped oval. Pit stops completed for most of the cars at this point. There's a look at our running order with 88 laps complete. Alex Zanardi led the most laps thus far. Greg Moore just behind him in second. Then Andre Ribeiro, Jimmy Vassar, Mark Blundell, Gilles DeFerran, Parker Johnstone, Brian Herta, Mauricio Gujamin, and Bobby Rahal round out the top five. See the field snaking through the side of Gary Bettenhausen's contact with the wall. He is out and okay. There you see the cars out of the race at this point. Gary Bettenhausen, of course, Juan Fangio, Michael Andretti. Hiro Matsushita has been warned that he is traveling too slowly on the racing line. Let's get down to Jan Bikas. 
in the Ganassi pits, what they are doing with Alex Zanardi is they have noticed he's been getting awfully close to Jimmy Vassar's pit. So they are actually changing the tape marks down here at the moment to move him back a few inches to be sure that not only does he line up with the fuel tank, but it gives him a few more inches to actually get out of the pits. I mentioned last time when he left here, he just brushed the rear wheel of Jimmy Vassar after that had been changed. Now, of course, he used all the steering lock he had, so the crew has decided to move him back just a few inches. I suppose that's one of the downside risks under the new pit rules, which bring in all of the cars on the same lap at the same time, is that you don't have time to space your cars. You have two cars out there. You want to get them both in at the same time so as to get them back out and still maintain positions. That's certainly a downside because especially when two guys are running up front like both Jimmy and Alex are, you have nothing but any choice in the world to bring them both in at the same time because you can't play favoritism. Now, for those of you who are just joining us, we were about an hour late getting underway, and this was the reason. The cars on the left of your screen, the front row of Vassar, Fernandez, and Herta coming around to take the green. Fernandez and Vassar got together, and a melee ensued that damaged at least 12 cars in the field. No one hurt, but we had a lengthy red flag while the field reformed in backup cars or repaired race cars with the exception of Fernandez. We look for Michael Andretti's car, as he works his way through debris flying in every direction. It was quite a moment. There you see the order, Zanardi and more up front than Ribeiro. Rest through the top 12. We'll be back. Back at Michigan, there is Mauricio Gujamin, showed in 11th place before he came through the pits and exceeded the 80 mile an hour speed limit. So in our first test of the new pit lane violation system, he moves to the back of the lead lap line as we prepare for the green flag. Down to James Allen for an update on our leader. Well, Bob, Alex zanardi has been told to turn his boost down two clicks. Now, I can't believe that anyone would really be worried about fuel there at this point, but obviously Zanardi has been running pretty hard and the team just trying to be a little bit conservative. Zanardi quite a hot foot, and of course he's got another hot foot behind him in Greg Moore. So maybe this will give Moore the opportunity he was looking for to go for the lead. The whole thing uh, of being out of sequence uh, has really benefited Mark Blundell. He had uh, one stop only up until that last uh, yellow, and he's still running in fifth place. By far and away, his best performance of the year. It's great to see a British guy up there. Let's go down to Young. Well, to further update what's happening with the Zanardi situation, remember, sometimes they turn the boost down not to lower it, but because they have telemetry to know if they might be slightly popping the valve. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they are saving fuel. Now, a quick update on Robbie Gordon. He has been in here a couple of times. They still know by the telemetry that they are low on voltage, but they think there might be another problem as well. They don't have anything else they can change. They've changed everything possible. We're just going to let Robbie Gordon go and see what happens. There you see Derek Walker mulling strategy the rest of the way. One of his team cars for Frederick Eckblum, replacing my booth colleague Scott Goodyear, is already out of the race. Now well, they must work with Robbie Gordon. Field still circulating behind the safety car. Track cleanup appears to be about complete. The ride with Christian Fittipaldi. Passing the jet dryer that blows the speedy dry off the track after it's been laid down to absorb all the fluid on the track. Person for a back in for a top up before sending him out so as not to lose too many positions. That's the key thing here. If you have to go in and out of the pits, you certainly need to try and keep on that same lap that you're on. So you come in, do a little bit of service work, pop in, do some work again, and keep going in and out. We'll take a quick time out and be back for the green flag as our live coverage continues at the U.S. 500. Stay with us. Left the line of cars on the lead lap led by race leader Alex Zanardi. Down below, Al Unzer Jr. leads the train of lapped cars. Now the lead lap cars begin to move in front as they are supposed to as we approach the green flag. Remember, no pass until they cross the start finish line. Here they come, building the revs and powering into turn one here at Michigan again. Greg Moore all over the back of race leader Zanardi. Now Zanardi draws away. Honda Power against Mercedes-Benz Gilmore. Alex being able to run that low line coming off of two. Looking like Greg maybe ran just a little bit high. 
keep in mind, two. we got a report a few moments ago that he had turned down his turbocharger boost just a little bit, and still he just drove away. Well, in some cases, if he is popping the valve, like Jan was talking about, he'll actually find a little bit more horsepower now because he will not be popping the valve by clicking the boost down what they call two notches. Along with that, when you do blow the valve, you actually do use a little bit more fuel, so he's going to get two positive moves out of that if indeed he was blowing the valve. A little bit more horsepower, saving of fuel. And as we can see now, he's pulling away. Robbie Gordon is back in the pits. Jan Bikas. Brought it in. He was actually told to come into the pits because the car, you can see some of the smoke coming out of the back. We've already talked about the fact that they have pretty much already replaced everything that they thought that they could. I'm looking carefully to see. Oh, here comes another electrical box. So I guess I was wrong. There are still a few more pieces that they could try. Now, the reason he was called in, we had a report that he was dangerous. And that doesn't mean necessarily that obviously there was smoke or oil. It means he wasn't running fast enough for the cars that are out on the track. They'll try and now see if they can cure the misfire and get him up to speed. And thanks very much, Jan. Meanwhile, Andre Ribeiro runs in the middle of that pack with the yellow nose on his car. And as Alex Zanardi passes the line, we're 100 laps into the event right now. Ribeiro showed intense spot. Phil DeFerrin just ahead is in ninth, so that'll be a battle for a position. Jimmy Vassar just ahead of DeFerrin comes under fire. This is for seventh place. Barrett takes it. Now you see one of the Penske's moving slowly and being passed. Take a look at which car that is. Ride with Jules Ferrand looking out the back. I mentioned before the Honda's running with about 900 horsepower. We should point out that with the reduction to 40 inches of boost for this 500 mile race, and the extra 100 revs or so they will take out of these cars to last the distance. The Honda probably operating at a little over 800, perhaps 820 horsepower. Still, that is a pretty stout push behind your back. For their part, the Mercedes-Benz engineers feel like they've come to terms with the Honda horsepower. And Ford and Toyota continue their efforts to catch up. So Mark Blundell down low. Comparison of lap speeds. Bell looks down the inside. Wendell is very forthright in his assessment of what it takes to drive the big ovals in America. He says he has really learned a few things. It's not something that you take with anything less than your full attention. Jan Bikas, what have you got? Ago. Sorry about that. I was waiting uh, for the mic to be open. You were talking about the horsepower. You said obviously 900 horsepower, we think, in the 45 inch boost trim for the Honda. Now, the Honda people feel as though they have an advantage when they're running at 40 inches of boost for two reasons. The first reason is they were the first engine manufacturer to have a special program to develop a specific engine just for 40 inches. They did that in 1995. But in 1996, they started a new program to reduce the friction on the engine. Now that would show more, you would think, at 40 inches of boost as opposed to 45. So the internal parts with less friction seem to be the key to the Honda speed. Gilda Ferran going underneath one of the Petsky cars. Now tucking back behind, that's Al Unzer Jr. Unzer Jr. presently shown in 16th place and a lap down. Ferran is around. Marty Reed has more on his situation. Yeah, guys, two stops ago, the team, Jim Hall's team, went the wrong direction. They changed the front wing. It was absolutely opposite of where they needed to. So this last stop, they corrected it. Obviously, it's working. This is a car that is on the move. And these guys, remember, this is one of two teams that literally was thrashing like crazy just to make the start. What a comeback story this would be after that crash. Well, they also had problems in qualifying. If you were with us, you know that Jim Ferran blew his engine waved off. Fortunately, it happened before he took the green flag for his qualifying laps. Came back at the end of the session and qualified the car solidly in the field. That was a close moment for them. You see 144 laps remaining on our EDS timing and scoring. There's a look at Gilles de Ferran. 
up from 13th to 4th position. Seven seconds as measured from the start finish line. Of course, it expands and contracts as the cars make their way around this two mile B shaped oval. Powering by Hiro Masushta in the Peyton Point entry. As we were listening to Jan talk about the 40 inches of boost, 40 inches will be what we're going to run at all the tracks next year in 1997 with all the kart races, be it road course, super speedway, or one mile track. Some other changes next year. Some improved head protection in the 1997 cars. A crushable zone back behind the driver's seat. So watch a great run here with Greg Moore in second, Andre Ribeiro chasing him in third. Some great laps being run, 226 miles an hour. We see Robbie Gordon still having a problem in the Valvoline car. Absolutely no power. Looks like he's pointing to go in behind the pit wall. Probably knows his day is done. Certainly no points for Robbie and the Derek Walker team here this weekend. And while the battle continues on the track between Greg Moore and Andre Ribeiro. Absolutely delighted with his victory earlier this year in Brazil. And of course, Rio de Janeiro was in full samba mode after that victory by a native son. Jan Bikas has more. Well, I have some more on Andre Ribeiro. I just spoke with Steve Horn, the team owner, and he said, Jan, remember, this car has never been run here. The last time we ran it was on a road course at Mid-Ohio Testing. They did not run it. They did not shake it down. What they did was they duplicated the settings of the primary car when they had to switch over to the spare after that first lap, or I should say, pace lap accident. And at the moment, the reports from Andre Ribeiro are the car is absolutely perfect. They down here are so excited. The only thing they're a little disappointed is that they did not have enough time to get the telemetry onto this car. So at the moment, they've done the old try and true method. They have him call in and read the, the settings off of the dashboard. All right, thanks, Jan. And that's a big boost for the Tasman International team, considering they weren't able to get Adrian Fernandez back into the race after that big crash at the start. Number 49, Parker Johnstone, now at the fifth spot, starting the race in 16th after a disappointing qualifying run. They certainly are one of the teams that found some speed over the last couple of weeks here. Absolutely. Parker Johnstone and the Bricks Racing Contact team got no testing here at Michigan after having some crash problems in the early races of the year. They spent a lot of time repairing race cars rather than testing them. So they really had to roll the dice weren't as fast as they wanted in qualifying, but they are one of the teams that found something, went and tested at Milwaukee on the oval there before coming back here. And they are one of the teams that picked up tremendous speed, running very competitively in the final days of practice before this inaugural US 500. Parker Johnstone being able to run that low line also. I saw him run high a little while ago, and now he's being able to run low. That tells you the car is working very, very well for him. I think we can recall that they also had to make some adjustments to this car, put some other parts on it after that crash. Running in seventh place, Parker Johnstone, the fourth generation rancher from the Pacific Northwest. Zanardi leads, and we'll be back to Michigan. Back live at Michigan, we're watching the battle for fifth place. Jimmy Vassar on the left has it. Parker Johnstone on the right wants it, and he goes underneath the points leader looking for it. This battle has gone on for several laps now, and Johnstone, <coughs> excuse me, Johnstone sweeps around to take fifth place from Vassar. Looks like Jimmy had a little bit of a hiccup there right in the center of turns three and four because Parker just picked up about eight or ten miles an hour and just walked completely past him. And he was trying that low line for about the last four or five laps and never being able to complete it. Jan Bikas has more on Parker Johnstone's situation. Well, we check with the team to find out which brand, not the brand, but which compound of the tires he's running. He is running the option compound just like Vassar. Thanks, Jan. Meanwhile, Greg Moore and Andre Ribeiro split a slower car in the battle for second place. Moore has it for the moment. One has to be impressed with the Mercedes power here, being able to run up front all day with the Honda power plants as Andre Ribeiro tries a lower line this time. He never seems to be able to complete it. Looks like he might have just a little bit too much drag on the car. And here he goes. He's going to try and get a tow right now. Slipstreams underneath. 
Nice timing. He's going to have to be able to try to complete it as he goes side by side into turn one. Andre comes out on top of that one. Brian Herta fired the first shot for Mercedes by qualifying a Mercedes-Benz powered car on the front row for this race. Right now, Greg Moore, the player's sponsored car for Jerry, For Jerry Forsyth's team, is giving it a good run as well. Here's a look at Ribeiro's progress thus far. The winner at New Hampshire last year. The Brazilian has truly found a place in IndyCar. Nine countries represented in the 27 cars that started this race. James Allen in the pits. Well, one guy who's really had a rough day, Robbie Gordon. We've heard all kinds of conflicting messages about the day you've had. We heard you had an undrivable car. Is that true? No, no, I, our car was great in traffic. I mean, it was a little slow when it's by itself, but, you know, I, I did the quickest laps I did all weekend in traffic. So, you know, Lee and the guys, they did a great job giving us a car. Um, looks like maybe something happened with electronics in the beginning, and then we ended up losing the motor. We noticed you used the draft a lot here today. Has that made a big difference to you and the Ford Runners? Uh, that's the only way I can keep up with those guys. Um, you know, but we're, we're, it's not over. Uh, things change by mid-season. Hopefully we'll be on power, and be looking forward towards the end of it. I always admire an optimist. Back to you guys. Thanks very much. The point situation behind leader Jimmy Vassar could be interesting following this race. Allen's a junior, second in points coming in, presently shown back in 16th spot, four laps down to the leader. As you watch Andre Ribeiro making his way around. Scott Pruitt, who came into this race third in points, is out and will score no points whatsoever. Greg Moore, who was fourth, just 13 behind Pruitt, runs third in the race. And Gilda Ferran, who came in in fifth, just three points behind Moore, is in fourth spot. Meanwhile, Alex Zanardi leads away. 126 laps remaining as you watch Ribeiro. Then Greg Moore, second and third, with slower traffic ahead. We've just gone past the halfway mark of the event at 125 laps. Everybody should know just about everything they need to know about the race car at this point in time. The weather conditions do not seem to be changing. They seem to be stable, cooling off maybe just a little bit from what we anticipate a little bit earlier today. But they should have a good understanding of the car. They should have a good understanding of the stagger that they want to use, the wing setups and how the car reacts in traffic. Everybody should just about be set from here on into the end of the race. Good look there at the huge crowd gathered here at Michigan International Speedway. The Indy cars will be back here later this summer for another epic battle, no doubt. The order is Zanardi, Ribeiro, Moore, DeFerran, Johnstone, Vassar, Herta, Blundell, Gujelman, and Rahal, your top ten. We well, see Allens are junior on our EDS timing and scoring. We'll have to find out what's going on with him. 16th place, four laps down. His teammate Paul Tracy is 14th and two laps down. So neither of the Marlboro Penske cars that normally run so strongly here having much luck today. Keep in mind, they seem to be substantially undamaged in that melee before the green flag to start this race. Ferran on the left, Parker Johnstone on the right, fourth and fifth. Johnstone crosses the stripe, having taken the position, it'll be Johnstone fourth, dropping DeFerran to fifth. Parker certainly got comfortable in his car after starting 16th, as we mentioned before. He's just marching forward. Seems to be able to run high and low like we talked about before. Parker very much a good thinker. Andre Ribeiro was running second, heading for the pits under green flag conditions. Yellow, yellow, yellow. And now the yellow comes out. So Ribeiro finds himself in an unusual position. I was about to say, I think that's the first green flag stop we were going to see from a leading car all day long. Now that we're at the halfway point of this race, but the yellow has now come out and caught Ribeiro in the pits. There's Bobby Rahal. Rahal shown in 10th place. And we have a safety vehicle out there. The report is that Bobby Rahal may have nudged the wall. I don't see any obvious damage to the car. Where is Rahal slowing? He's being waved past the pace car. 
finally have confirmation that Bobby Ray Hall, the three time series champion, did touch the wall. No obvious suspension damage at the front. Doesn't look like it. You can get away with just a graze, as we saw a little bit earlier on. The key thing is that Ribeiro maybe didn't have the greatest timing. Everybody else is going to now start the pit as we we're just starting to enter the fuel window. For all these guys out here. The engine sounds fine. The pits are now open following the yellow flag. Safety vehicles checking up high for debris. There is Greg Moore's pit. David Letterman, now a minority owner in Bobby Ray Hall's team. This is his first visit to an IndyCar race as a man with a stake in the action. Now the pit is open and Alex Zanardi. The race leader is in. There's Greg Moore. His team goes to work. Now keep in mind, you can change positions in the pits. So if Greg Moore can get a good pit stop, get back out, he has a shot at taking the lead away from Alex Zanardi. Jimmy Vassar brings his car in, and Moore is on the move. Some more wing adjustments for Jimmy Vassar. Looks like they're adding some more wing into the front of the car. Must be dealing with an understeer situation. Good quick stop, lighting the tires up as he leaves. Ray Hall, his team taking a close look at the suspension, talking over the radio. Let's get down to Jan Bikas. Just to update, Scott, you were exactly correct. They did put more wing into the front of Jimmy Vassar's car. He's had quite a bit of a pushing condition. Also, this may have worked exactly the way that Andrew Ribeiro wanted it to, because with this new format, he should go to the front. Let's get down to Marty. Okay, thanks, Jan. A very disappointed Bobby Rahal is going to be unplugging and climbing out of the cockpit because it looks like the right rear has got too much damage to it, and they think that was the right rear tire that went down. We'll try and talk to Bobby, find out what happened. There you see Bobby Rahal climbing out, no doubt bitterly disappointed. And you're right, Jan. Andre Ribeiro, I was going to say, timed it perfectly. Here's a look first at what happened to Bobby Rahal. Getting high up into the gray section, getting close to the wall. There you go. That's a reasonably hard hit. Got both the front and the rear wheel. Although we, he did what we call pancake the car, both the wheels hit flat. You never know if there's some damage to the uprights, the push rods, or the heim joints on that race car. And maybe not be wanting to drive around here at 230 miles an hour. Here we go again in slow motion. You can see the cars crept up into the gray. That's the magnesium wheel you see the sparks coming from when it makes contact to the cement wall. That's a reasonably hard hit as you can see his head move about inside the cockpit. Terminal understeer into the wall for Bobby Ray Hall. There is the running order with 130 laps complete. We'll be back with more from Michigan in just a moment. Back at Michigan, Mercedes-Benz pace car is out there. There's a look at the running order with 131 laps complete as the cars form up in double file. We prepare for a restart. And you see Andre Ribeiro down there leading the lapped cars. Turns out his pit situation didn't work out as well as we originally thought. Alex Zanardi running strong at the front of this race. Now he brings the revs up. He had a brilliant restart last time. And it looks like he's going to get another good one. Greg Moore just not able to come up on the cam as quickly as Zanardi can. But the yellow remains out. No crossed flags. There's Budweiser's aerial ambassador, the Bud One airship, providing our aerial shots of the Michigan International Speedway. Look for the Bud One airship in Atlanta, the 1996 Summer Olympic Games. We're glad to have them with us here today. Good look from high overhead. The massive parking lots full to capacity for this running of the inaugural US 500. Down in the pit lane, here's Marty Reed. Bobby Ray Hall checking the board, checking on probably Brian Herta. What happened uh, that put you out? I just was fighting understeer. I couldn't get it out. And uh, if I tried to get too much of it out, then it would get loose in traffic at the exits of the corners and it just pushed. And, and I was trying to stay ahead of the leaders there and just uh, they just uh, took off on me coming off of two and just touched the wall. I mean, hard enough, obviously, to bend it, but uh, fortunately, that was all you were saying you had it harder on the pedal going into the corner just to get the nose to come down I was having to touch the brake pedal just to get the nose to come down to keep the you know the center of pressure forward on the car because we uh, 
We're just a little too light on downforce. And the next stop, we were going to put more front wing in it. Unfortunately, uh, we never got to it. But, uh, you know, Brian's doing a good job. It's been a tough day for him so far, and he's doing a super job. So uh, we'll uh, we'll cheer for him now. Bobby Rejo out of this one. Well, an update on Gilles de Ferran because he was in fourth place when they came in, but unfortunately one of the lug nuts just was not going on properly. He ends up backing up four spots. He's in eighth. He's going to have to work hard again to get back in that top five. All right, thank you, men, men, gentlemen. It would be hard to say. The ride with Gilles de Ferran. I may have mentioned earlier that uh, Andre Ribeiro and his teammate Adrian Fernandez were in Reynard chassis. Of course, they are in Lola's. Right now you ride with Jill DeFerrant. Interesting what Bobby Rahal had to say. It gives you some insight into what it's like to drive these cars. Having to tap the brake pedal to try to keep the nose down, fighting that understeer that eventually put him in the wall. Well, exactly. And, and you do that by keeping your foot completely on the gas, trying to keep the speed and the velocity of the car going as quickly as possible through the turns. And if you just put your foot over to the left foot, your left foot over to the brake and dab the pedal a little bit, sometimes you can get the weight of the car up to the front and make the front of the car hook and get around the turn just a little bit better. It's a very key thing to do at 220 miles an hour as you're tap dancing on the pedals and trying to balance the car by changing the weight distribution by using the brake pedal. A friend of mine, David Hobbs, said a lot of people think racing is just like going to the grocery store, only faster. It's nothing like that at all. What these guys are doing out there really is something special as an athletic exercise. Now apparently Andre Ribeiro is not precisely where officials want him to be there. You see him at the back of that picture going down on the apron and moving forward. So he started at the lead of the lap line of cars. They moved him to the rear of the lead lap line of cars. And now he's changing addresses again. And officials are working on the system. They want to get it completely right. Now I'm not sure exactly where Andre Ribeiro is going now. Unless he somehow managed to cop a lap in all of that maneuvering and they want to send him around to put him back on the same fuel mileage system. Jan Bikas, what can you tell us? Well, you're exactly right, Bob. That's what they're going to do. They're going to take Andre Ribeiro, have him pass the entire pack, and then circle all the way around, and then take the position that he had a moment ago at the back of the field. So they will have him now actually make up that lap as opposed to just moving him. Like you said, it makes a big difference potentially at the end with fuel. Okay, Jan. Geez, I did something right today. <laughs> Suss that one out. Now, Eddie Lawson, who I think I saw at the front of the lapped car line, the four-time motorcycle champ, apparently has violated the blend line regulations. That is, entering or leaving the pits, getting up too soon or too late. He is going to go to the rear of the line as well. There you see the motorcycle champ driving for Gallus Racing. In his first year in IndyCars, following several campaigns in the Indy Light Series. We expect the green flag this time by. We'll see if the Mercedes-Benz pace car pulls off. Field bunching up. Some of the cars have allowed themselves to string back around turns three and four, so they'll move up quickly. We'll see if Alex Zanardi gets on it again. Nope, the safety car will stay out, so apparently track seems clear all the way around, so apparently we're going to have a little bit more consultation about this. Now they're saying Lawson is still misaligned. He is at the lead of the lapped car line. Jan Bikas, can you clear things up? Well, somewhat. First of all, we know that Eddie Lawson at the moment is the person that was out of line, but Andrew Averro, after now making up that lap, it wasn't just for fuel. They are putting him back on the lead lap. So he hasn't lost a lap. They've decided that they're going to rectify the situation. Boy, that's good news for Tasman. They have a chance now to run and stay on the lead lap. Well, there you see Ribeiro. Meanwhile, Eddie Lawson has taken his place at the back of the lead lap, it would appear, just behind Ribeiro. There you see him coming up right behind Andre. So he is back in line. We'll see what happens this time around. The pace car has now pulled well clear of the field. You see Billy Camphausen from IndyCar talking with the Gallus team to explain what they're doing with their man on the racetrack. And we need to credit IndyCar officials. They're doing this for safety reasons, and it will also help improve the show by keeping the cars together that are racing with one another when the yellow comes out. Could it be a tough situation 
correcting the positions of all of these cars, and they're doing a great job. Now the pace car is in. Alex Zanardi brings it up again onto the cams across the start-finish line. We are back to green flag here at the U.S. 500. Jimmy Vassar having a look on the underneath side of Greg Moore, not being able to get the deal done. And one of the Penske cars making a great run in the low line there. Looks like Paul Tracy. Tracy goes around Moore. He has a couple of laps to make up. There's Al Unser Jr. running just behind Jimmy Vassar as he ducks low under Greg Moore. Those are car numbers in parentheses on our EDS timing and scoring to help you identify the cars yourself. Zanardi, car number four. You see Parker Johnstone's number 49. Andre Ribeiro's number 31. Take a good look at Greg Moore. Lenzer Jr. coming up from behind him. A great shot of speed coming off that number two turn. On the exit there, about 225 miles an hour as you come up close to the wall. Quite a thing to do when you're by yourself, but another thing to do when you've got cars in front of you, behind you, and somebody generally beside you, disturbing the air of your own car. I saw from that graphic that Al Enzer Jr. started well, but then dropped well back in the field. He remains several laps down at this point. But both he and teammate Paul Tracy appear to be running competitively again. There is still plenty of time to go. 110 laps, 220 miles remain. This inaugural U.S. 500. Roberto Moreno down low, racing with Unzer. Three abreast across the stripe. That's a great feeling, I'll tell you. Only here at Michigan you can do that. Nice wide track. And you can also enter into turn three. That's a That's great feeling impressed. for you. It's a great feeling for me sitting way up here, well out of the way, as Mark Blundell gets involved in that fight. Goes around Roberto Moreno. Eddie Lawson tightens things up. Or excuse me, that's Brian Herta in the shell car. Back up to full speed, lapping at the 226, 227 mile an hour bracket. Zanardi, Vassar, Moore, Blundell, Herta. Can't get over how well Mark Blundell is running. Gilda Ferrem runs sixth. Andre Ribeiro seventh. Parker Johnstone eighth. Mo Gujami ninth. And Roberto Moreno in the tenth spot. Then Christian Fittipaldi a lap down, as is Moreno. Eddie Lawson, Paul Tracy, Stefan Johansson, and Al Unzer Jr. Jeff Krosnoff and Emerson Fittipaldi. Matsushita is still not officially out of the race, but he is 15 laps down to the leader. A little twitch there from Blundell as he negotiates this two-mile D-shaped oval. James Allen, what have you got on your countryman? Well, it's doing, he's doing really well. As I mentioned before, he's been helped a lot by being out of pit stop sequence, and that certainly got him into that high position in the first place. Remind you, of course, he's only using the Ford XB engine, not the XD, so he's doing real well to live with uh, Greg Moore and, of course, all of the Hondas as well. But really, the story of the weekend for Mark Blundell is the tough psychological battle he's had to undergo to bounce back from that huge 195-mile-an-hour accident, almost head-on into a wall at Rio de Janeiro. A man who's not at all used to racing on ovals, a European road racer, if ever there was one. And he's been longing for a road course, but here he is at Michigan, and he's really running well. Very, very good news. In fact, Mark Blundell figured to be strong on the road courses. He has missed both of the street circuit races held thus far, those in Surfer's Paradise Australia and in Long Beach, California, due to his injuries. His first four races have all been on ovals. We see Ribeiro is now past DeFerran, up into sixth spot, so he's making his march back through the field. He needs to get back up to front to chase the target cars of Zanardi and Vassar. Right now he runs about seven and a half seconds behind the race leader Zanardi. We watch from DeFran's cockpit. You see the buffeting that was coming along by watching Gilles DeFran's helmet move around inside the cockpit. That's just getting a little bit of disturbed air coming off the car up in front. Now DeFran, like he's slowing. He is down low and just entering the pit lane. And that is not good news. Only 15 laps since the last fuel stop and pit stop, so certainly that won't be the call here. The team has tires in the pit lane. We're taking a look at the pop-off valve. 
which rises out of the rear cowling, the rear bodywork on that car, down to Marty Reed. They have blown the pop-off valve gasket, so they have got to get in there and uh, fix it because otherwise he's just not going to get any boost pressure whatsoever. This is extremely costly. This is going to take all their chances for victory away. What a disappointment. This team had really busted chops just to make the start, or actually the restart of this race. You see Alex Herring, team manager on the far side, vastly experienced. We have yellow all the way around. We understand it is for fluid on the racetrack from Jeff Krosnoff's Archiero Wells Reynard Toyota. There you see him making his way to the pits. We'll have another yellow flag and another restart. We'll be back with more live coverage as Krosnoff puts the steering wheel on the cowling. It appears that his race is run as well. We'll be back. Back at Michigan, there is race leader Alex Zanardi as the safety cars are on the track, and there is Jeff Krosnoff's Reynard with Toyota Power being towed behind the wall. His day is done, and he's standing by with James Allen. Jeff, I guess you've got mixed feelings. The most race laps you've completed, but uh, the fluid down the track from a fairly seriously blown engine. Well, I hope I didn't mess it up too badly for everyone else. Um, yeah, the, everything was running well. We, our pit stops were good. We were just running our own race. You know, we weren't looking for a win. We were going to finish the race and put some more miles on this engine and uh, it ran well all day and it just like go unexpectedly which is just part of the normal development of a brand new motor like Toyota. The learning curve for Toyota continues. Thanks a lot Jeff. Jeff Grosnow from La Cañada, California. His shot at a million dollars at the US 500 is now gone. There's the Ellenser Jr. undergoing service in the Penske pits. 96 Penske, Mercedes, Benz, and Marlboro colors, the most recognized trademark in the world. The sky's darkening just a little bit as the afternoon goes on here at Michigan International Speedway. You ride with Christian Fittipaldi as the cars are now in double file. The Toyota safety car will be off, and we expect to have a green flag. Now, look at the back of Christian Fittipaldi's car. The pneumatic jack stand that extends from the bottom of the car to lift the car off the ground for service has not retracted. Now what can happen with that quite quickly is he can go over a bump and that will shoot itself back up into its position or he'll go over a bump and it will completely break off. I had that here back in 1992 as we've now hit the green flag and Zanardi fast across the strike being chased by his teammate Jimmy Vassar as they hustle into turn one. Three wide down into turn one. It was that Fittipaldi who went down low all the way under the white line to make up a position. The order is Zanardi, Vassar, Moore, Blundell, and Ribeiro. Christian Fittipaldi shown in ninth place and one lap down, so he would want to hustle because that was his best opportunity to get that lap back. Less than 100 laps remaining. We look there at Paul Tracy with Christian just behind him. Jill DeFerrin, who had that problem, has lost five laps in the pits. And we understand that it was a hose to the turbo unit. Possibly the same problem that cost him a sure victory back at Long Beach. Up front, a pair of targets, so to speak. Alex Zanardi and his teammate Jimmy Vassar, the pole setter for this race, running nose to tail, first and second for Chip Ganassi's team. Now, Bob, you say teammates, I can assure you that when it comes down to situations like this, teammates, not a word that I don't think either one of those guys are going to really understand. In the time-honored tradition of racing teammates, Jan Bikas, what can you add? I can add as to the handling of both those two cars. We said earlier that Jimmy Vassar was struggling. They put a lot of downforce on the car to settle it down in traffic. Now they have got the handling where they want it by working with tire pressures, and now they feel that Jimmy Vassar is just carrying a little bit too much drag. So watch him follow Zanardi. He seems as though he does fine in the draft, but if he gets on his own, he can't run quite as quickly. So the next time they come in in the pits, they're going to try and take some of that drag off the car to free him up. But right now, he's a lot happier than he was in the early part of the race. There is Chip Ganassi watching his boys circumnavigate this racetrack. Both cars on Firestone tires. Two of the ten cars Firestone supplies in the series. And together they have given Firestone three poles, two by Vassar, one by Zanardi, and four victories. Three by Vassar, excuse me, three victories. Those being by Vassar, the other Firestone win from Ribeiro. Zanardi with Vassar right there on him. They take some downforce out of that car. He's really going to fly. Oh, he certainly is. And uh, one thing you might want to do, because there's still quite a few laps to the end right now, is that put it in top gear, follow Zanardi, conserve fuel, conserve the engine. 
the race victory still is about uh, well, somewhere around 100 laps away. Long way still to be run, but it is amazing what Chip Ganassi has done with his team. He has made some very bold moves, changing engines, changing tires, changing chassis. Now as the American representative for Reynard, a factory team, so to speak. And it is just remarkable. They went through some very lean years, and now they're definitely the biggest dog on the porch at this point of the season. They certainly are, as you mentioned, with three race wins already this year, sitting up on front, sitting on pole a few times. We see Greg Mueller in that blue and white car, the player's car, being chased by Andre Ribeiro. And Greg has sat there all day, just kept on pushing. Second, third, fourth spot, running high, running low, and probably down a little bit of horsepower very slightly to the cars in front of him and behind him being the Honda power cars. Ribeiro now is going to try and catch up on a tow off of Newer. Credit Ribeiro, that other Firestone winner for coming back from all of that shuffling during the restart. Using the low line, can't make much of a dent. Gonna drift up now, catch that draft. See if he can get a good tow going into turn one. I think what we're seeing here also is that Andre's having a bit of a hard time even catching up to Moore, even in a tow. Probably a little bit too much drag on that car. Oh, yeah. And Greg Moore spins. Spins exiting turn two. Down on the infield grass with lots of room to slide to a spot. Yeah, and a great job. Hung on to a couple of 360s through the grass, as he talked about earlier on. A little bit of agricultural experience there. Gets it back in the straightaway position, and away he goes. I would say that right rear tire is looking a little questionable right now. He came off of turn two. Looked like the back end got loose. The pits are closed as the yellow flag waves. Now he's going to have to make a decision whether he's going to stay out or come in. If he comes in, he's going to find himself penalized. Here's a replay. Ah. Now with Andre being right behind him on the exit of that turn, might have just taken a little bit of rear air off that wing on the back end of the car. What a great job of hanging on to it, though. Here's another look. Just oversteering off of that corner. The back end comes around so quickly. And a pack of cars arrived on the scene, wondering what happened to create all that blue smoke. Yes, here you go. You can see it. The car's just starting to walk itself out. You can see he's correcting. I saw something flash up from the right <laughs> rear top. Exactly. The I can see a lot of things going on there, including the cameraman falling down to the ground, thinking his day was over. It'll be a combat bonus for our cameraman out there on the backside. Meanwhile, Marty Reed. Well, guys, uh, we have got tires around here everywhere. Everybody trying to take a look. You can see the one that is shredded. It looks like it may have been a tire problem, and the guys are going through it. We'll try and double check. They really aren't quite sure what caused this just yet, but he's already been in and back out. Now, we make fun about our uh, cameraman back there on the back stretch. We should point out that that move was out of instinct. He is well protected back there by several barriers to prevent debris moving in his direction. Once again, that spectacular spin. There's a glass shield back there as well. I believe it's made of Lexan or one of those high-performance products they use for racing windshields for sedans. Look at Moore fighting this car all the way. Once it is gone, it is gone completely. You probably saw something flash up from the right rear tire as the car started to come around and that wasn't any medical metal object or anything of that nature that looked like it was a tear off from a driver's shield. Just so happens that the two happen to go along at the same time. Mark Clintworth running camera for us on the backside he can now add another. Battle decoration. Once again we are under caution pit crews at the ready as is Jan Bikas. The pit crews, as far as the Ganassi team, have given us the updates what they're going to change on the cars. They're waving their arms. Alex Zanardi will be here first. There will be no changes. Then with Jimmy Vassar, just as we talked about, they come in side by side. Jimmy Vassar, they will take off the rear wicker bill. They've already flipped up the tab. They're going to first change the tire. Then one of the mechanics will go to the back of the car if they stay with their plan. We're watching. Sure enough, there it goes. The rear wicker is out. That will take some of the downforce. But there's a problem on the right rear. Gets it tight, but boy, that cost him some time. Jimmy Vassar has an improved handling car, but he lost a lot here in the pits. And Alex Zanardi had a very long pit stop just exiting the pits. The pits now, as you see, Jimmy Vassar making his way along the blend line. He'll be moving back onto the racetrack shortly. 
Lots of cars went by while the two Target Ganassi Racing teammates sat there in the pit lane. One of those cars I think I saw go by in the background looked like Brian Herta. Looked like he had a good stop. From high overhead, here's another look at that spin for Greg Moore, 220 odd miles an hour, looping it three, four, maybe complete revolutions. Marty Reed has more. Well, guys, we were talking to the team and uh, they checked the tires. It was not a tire problem. They just said that Greg just plain lost it. Now, he did come in while the pits were closed, so he will not be the race leader. He will have to go back to the back to the longest line. James, what you got? Well, here's something you don't see every, every day. This is, you can see the jack at the back of Christian Fittipaldi's car has been stuck down. Now, they're just changing the tires, but in a minute, they've got a hacksaw here. They're going to hacksaw the, uh, the old one off and they're going to jam a spring up on the inside. You see the mechanic now just checking it, see if there's anything he can do about it. That's why they had to uh, lift it up on a manual jack, but uh, it's back out there. Paul Newman's happy, but uh, well, we wait to see whether or not it'll last. All right, thanks, James. Christian Fittipaldi makes his way back onto the racetrack. Let's get back to Jan Bikas. Well, Bob, you were talking about Alex Sinardi, and of course, our view was obscured when Jimmy Vassar came in. What happened was Alex Sinardi slid past the marks. That's why he had a long pit stop. They had to pull him back so that the fuel hose could connect. Sinardi, they did get all the fuel, but that's what cost him the time down here on pit road. Well, we'll catch our breath after that exciting moment for Greg Moore. Meanwhile, it looks like all of the pit action has been completed. We'll be back for the restart in just a moment. Field, Parker Johnstone is at the head of it. That's Parker moving ahead in the upper line, the high groove, the lead lap cars. As we prepare for a restart this time around. There you see Parker Johnstone, who's had such a fraught season thus far with two or three big crashes. They have their car in the lead at the U.S. 500, and here's Jan Bikas. Just a quick update on Parker Johnstone before we go back to green. The crew here, for a few moments anyway, was incensed because they said, why is Moore in front of us? He should have a penalty. They were screaming they wanted to have the lead. And then all of a sudden, all their tempers calmed down. They said, okay, they are going to assess a penalty. Now there's a lot of big smiles down here in the BRICS Comtech team. I'll bet Doug Peterson and Don Erb, who have raced with Parker Johnstone for many, many years in IMSA sports car competition. He is the winningest driver in that series history with 54 total wins. Now they are an IndyCar team. And Parker Johnstone leads the way as they return to the flag stand where Jim Swintall waves the green. And Parker Johnstone leads them down into turn one once again. Parker finding himself in familiar territory, obviously leading this event last year before a problem put him out. Probably one of the teams that have done more miles of testing here at Michigan last year, a combination of this year than anybody else. Michigan is a place that has produced a number of first time winners over the year. Emerson Fittipaldi, his first win came in a 500 miler here back in 1985. Who is this? Scott Goodyear, I believe, also won a 500 miler here for his first IndyCar win. John Paul Jr., back in 1983, and Scott Pruitt last year. Bit of shuffling now. Parker Johnstone followed by Ribeiro. Brian Herta. Brian's been a little bit quiet after a couple of problems about mid race, but he's just sitting there. Always ready to pounce. Good look at the Shell Reynard Mercedes Benz with Goodyear tires for Bobby Ray Hall and David Letterman's team. Going up high. The car's exit turn four very high, right up by the wall for diving down across the banked start finish straightaway. You might even call it a dog leg, as we often see in tri ovals elsewhere in the country. Now, on the back stretch, the two Ganassi cars. Vassar and Zanardi now shown in fourth and fifth positions following those somewhat bulky pit stops they just experienced. Vassar having a peek on the underside of Herta, and a great run for both the target cars here. Zanardi trying to get somewhere in the center. Now he's going to take the low line. That was close. Oh, man. I think maybe Zanardi just misjudged the room he had ahead of his teammate's gearbox as he came rushing up from behind. Simply had nowhere to go. And Vassar's pass on Herta kind of stalled out when they were alongside one another. Well, the key thing there, I think, too, is that he's the third guy in the toe, and he's going to start to get that big rush of speed. As we see, looks like he's going to slip right underneath Vassar now. And Vassar's going to take the low line and catch on behind Zanardi. Now they're coming up behind DeFerrand, who unfortunately was right there 
in the hunt of everything until he lost four or five laps in the pits. Boy, I'll bet that raised the pulse rates in the Ganassi pits. As you see, Zanardi going right by Differan, and now here comes Jimmy Vassar. Zanardi up into the third spot behind Parker Johnstone and Andre Ribeiro. And there, once again, looking back from the Pennzoil car of Differan, Jimmy Vassar poking his nose up the outside now. Now don't forget, in the pits they have the monitors just like we're seeing right now, like you're seeing at home. Chip Ganassi, Joe Montana are watching their guys do battle on the racetrack, watching the same view as you and I. Vassar completes the pass. Meanwhile, there is Ribeiro with the bright day glow yellow nose. And Zanardi now taking a shot at him. Tremendous speed from these Reynard Honda Firestone combinations. For Chip Ganassi's team, Zanardi and Vassar. And we saw there, look how low those guys are going. They're down below the white line. That is pretty impressive. You think the lower that you go, the more G's you're going to put on the car, the grip that these cars are making with the downforce, also with the Firestone tires, is incredible. Also, the last lap, 232 miles an hour. That's qualifying speed, Bob. Absolutely. Zanardi just flying around this racetrack. Jan, what's going on? Well, Zanardi is flying, but Ribeiro is having some handling problems. And think also that the Tasman team decided to go with the primary tires, which is a little bit harder. V Vassar now is going to take and also take advantage of the fact that he's on the softer option Firestones. Both those two cars you just saw are on Firestones, but the option being trickier in this cooler weather seems really to be playing now to the speed. And I think that's the key element, on is the cooler weather. It's like 5.30 in the afternoon right now, and the temperature's probably going down a little bit. You can see people in the stands starting to put jackets on. Anything, if you're on those optional tires, is probably what you want right now. And we've got an engine smoking, and it looks like one of the target cars. Zanardi has lost the engine. And that is a rarity for a Honda engine, but I think we saw that those guys were running laps at 232 miles per hour. And that will bring out the yellow once again. Zanardi got it down low on the racetrack very quickly. But the safety crews are going to go out and have a look as he pulls the car onto the grass. The 500 miles have taken another toll. There is Chip Ganassi on the right, Mo Nunn on the left. Sort of a rueful smile from Chip Ganassi. He's been there a long time, seen the good and the bad in the sport. The guys ran it hard, and look at the amount of smoke he sends wafting up. Well, you won't find a mosquito here at Michigan International for a couple of weeks. That's that, I think he said. So Alex Zanardi learns the hard lessons of running 500 miles here at Michigan. He is out of the car. Meanwhile, Parker Johnstone, also running with Honda Power, also in a Reynard chassis, leads away. We'll be back for more from Michigan. The U.S. 500 continues. Back at Michigan, Bob Varsha along with Scott Goodyear. We are under a yellow flag, and here is why. The red car second in line, Sandro Zanardi, had a Honda engine let go in a very big way. And that's very surprising because Honda's really been on the forefront of not only the horsepower, but the longevity, being able to run many miles at high speeds. But I think, as we heard about before, 232 miles an hour for those last few laps. Probably a little bit quick here with too many more miles to go. What's it like to be coming up behind an engine explosion like that? There you see it up ahead of Christian Fittipaldi, and watch how the haze lingers. Now somebody's he's slowing down, and he's just taking. Oh, Ooh. that was so close with Greg Miller. So close. Oh my! We almost had a much more serious incident. Jan Bikas. Chip Ganassi was one of those that had the opportunity, unfortunately for you, to see all that smoke as it went by. Any indication from anyone that there was a problem prior to that? Well, we had, we did have an indication, Jan. The problem was uh, we had about a three-second uh, notice that we lost oil pressure, and, I mean, there was nothing you could do about it. But you still have another car in the field, so you can still have a smile knowing that. And also, Jimmy Vassar, the first thing he did was call in and say what great racing that was and congratulated this side of the team. No question. I think Alex had him covered today, and I'll tell you, this has to be the major disappointment of the season so far. Hopefully, we got, uh, I don't know, about 60 laps to go. We can make something of it here. We got another car. All right, Jimmy Vassar seems almost as fast. We'll see what he can salvage for this man, Chip Ganassi. 
It has been pretty much a Ganassi team week or a couple of weeks here at Michigan. Vassar on poles and already led much of the day. We'll be back. Vassar runs second to Parker Johnstone. Back at Michigan, Alex Zanardi walks away after receiving a hug from team owner Chip Ganassi. After leading more than half of the race, 134 laps to be precise, that plume of white smoke was the end of Alex Zanardi's shot at a possible million dollars here and at that is the inaugural rare. US 500. Those shots coming from the Bud One airship and its eye in the sky camera proud to provide you pictures from more than a thousand feet above Michigan International Speedway. And we are very glad to have them. We'll be back to talk with Alex Zanardi about his continuing frustration perhaps the fastest man in IndyCar who has yet to score significantly in a race. The young Italian however has a big future. We'll be back in a moment. Back at Michigan the Mercedes Benz safety car on the track with the field in tow. We are under our ninth caution of the day here at the US 500. The record for caution flags in a 500 mile race here at Michigan International 13 set in 1985 when Emerson Fittipaldi started 19th and finished first in the Marlboro 500 for his first IndyCar win. Down to Jan Bikas in the pits. Well Alex Zanardi now has had the first smile that we've seen since he got here. I know that's awfully tough for you emotionally. You had this race covered. Chip Ganassi just told us that you guys had the best car the best driver. What are your emotions right now. Well it's the end of a wonderful dream. Uh, I was I, I was sure that today was my day but apparently it, didn't, it wasn't and uh, it's really bad to wake up uh, from a wonderful dream like it was uh, in that way. But this is racing. I mean. I'm, I'm happy because we proved that uh, we are a wonderful team. All, the old target Ganassi Racing did a wonderful job. I had a beautiful car. I'm very happy because uh, in, in the last two weeks I've been able to think about what we did and I came back much stronger. I had the possibility to give uh, the right information to make myself, uh, make myself the best car and I was driving very well. Didn't last till the end. All right. Well, you have an opportunity now to Watch the other target Ganassi, Jimmy Vassar, try and take it home for you guys. Thank you, Alex. Let's get down to James Allen. Mark Blundell currently running now in third place, basically because he's mastered the art of drafting, according to the, according to the team. Simply on power terms, he shouldn't be anywhere near where he is at the moment. But he's running strong because he's learned that. But he had a drama on his last stop because the fuel valve stuck open at the top. Quite a bit of fuel spilled out the top, but luckily we didn't get a pit fire. Now, the disadvantage of this means that he's going to have to do two more stops because they cannot carry a full load of fuel because of this stuck open valve. So Mark Blundell having his best run so far. We will see. All right, thanks very much. Parker Johnstone brings the car up to speed. The green flag waves. We are back under green conditions. Four cars running nose to tail. As we restart on lap 184, we have spent a total of 64 laps under caution today here at Michigan. There we see positions one, two, three, and four in our picture frame right now. Parker Johnstone on the left of your screen, and Jimmy Vassar, followed by Mark Blundell and Greg Moore. There is Parker. What is the nose on that car? They had to replace the nose after he was involved in that crash that brought out the red flag before this race ever got underway. That's a fresh part. They slapped some decals on it, and away he went. There is Jimmy Vassar. He's gotten that car loosened up just a little bit after the last pit stop. There is Mark Blundell having by far his best race as an IndyCar driver. Of course, it is only his fourth start following injuries suffered in the race at Rio de Janeiro earlier this year. His best finish thus far, 17th in the season opener at the Dade County Homestead Motorsports Complex near Miami, Florida. And his teammates actually currently running fifth, so Pac West having a great day, third and fifth so far, with about uh, 75 laps left to go. And a little wiggle we saw coming out of Gujanin. I think there's a bit of a bump coming off that corner because I've seen cars wiggle there before. Vassar on the left, followed by Blundell. Got Honda Power Plant first and second, Ford XB in third, Mercedes in fourth, and another XB in fifth. Surprisingly, XBs, no XDs to be seen. That's right, the XB being the later iteration of the Ford 2.65 liter turbocharged V8 for IndyCar competition. Incredible bits of technology. These engines built to such fine tolerances that they use few, if any, gaskets in them anymore. 
As many as 4,000 parts, three times as many as you'll find in your streetcar engine. Capable of extraordinary things, revving to maybe 14,000 revs, although not here in a 500-mile race. Tremendous horsepower from methanol, a renewable resource used as fuel in IndyCar. Now Johnstone has Vassar just up his gearbox. Vassar goes high and then drops back. We've seen this a little bit earlier today, that the high line is not what Jimmy seems to like. He likes to be able to go a little bit lower. That cost him a little bit of speed. Coming off of turn two, Blundell had a look on the inside. The first time this year that Mark Blundell has really had an opportunity to come to grips with racing at the sharp end of the grid. Doing just a great job, though. Think about the time that he spent in the car, not a whole lot compared to how much testing these other guys have done. Maybe not so much so with Parker Johnstone as they've had a rough start at the beginning of the season. And Bledel sneaks under. underneath Vassal. What a nice move right down to the line going through turns one and two. Probably a little bit surprising. I was a bit surprised because Vassar was able to get up alongside Johnstone but could never complete the pass. And I guess it wasn't because Johnstone was getting quicker but because Vassar was getting out of it. You saw he bobbled just that moment and Blundell was there to jump all over him and take second place away. Great drive from Mark Blundell. The Pac West guys have certainly had a bit of a rough start to the season also. So they're certainly probably just loving this. Especially after Mark's accident back in Rio. And both he and I ended up getting hurt. The order behind these Vassar runs third, Moore fourth, Gujaman fifth, and Ribeiro, Herta, Christian Fittipaldi, Eddie Lawson, and Roberto Moreno. Fittipaldi, Lawson, and Moreno all one lap down. Here's Jan Bikas with more on Jimmy Vassar. As far as what's happening with Jimmy Vassar, remember that before the time that he came in and put on more downforce on the car was because it did not work well in traffic. So when Blundell came up and took the air away from him, that's why he dropped back so quickly. At the moment, his car runs fast, but he struggles in traffic. The other Pac West car is on the move. That's Mauricio Gujelmin on the right, Greg Moore on the left. Moore is in fourth. Gujelmin trying to get around him. Ticking off the lap, 60 remaining in the inaugural running of the U.S. 500. The driver and car owner from the winning team will get their names inscribed on the three-foot solid silver Vanderbilt Cup. And the winning driver will pick up a check for a minimum of $1 million. If Jimmy Vassar is the man to pick up that check, they can add 45 grand to the end of it because he'll pick up the rollover Marlboro pole bonus for winning the race from the pole. And keep in mind, there are also contingency bonuses in here. There is lap money to be taken into account. The winners, in fact, all of the top finishers in this race are coming into a tremendous payday at the inaugural U.S. 500. Now, once again, Guzelmin taking the low line as he looks at the back of Greg Moore's Reynard. You know, when you think about this, we're around 200 laps. What a competitive race. The first guys, first to six, are all covered by about three seconds. Some great racing here, high and low, people trying each other, getting drafts. And what concentration the drivers have had to maintain all day. We had the big crash that brought out the red flag, nine separate interruptions for yellow flags, having to learn all the new pit rules, and yet everyone doing a tremendous job. We expected attrition. It hasn't really been as bad as I expected it might be. 11 cars out of the race among the 27 starters, if you include Adrian Fernandez, who never really started the race after the damage suffered to his car in the red flag crash. 16 cars remain on the track. It's quite impressive, especially when you think that we're going 500 miles. We've seen some great racing so far as we look at Greg Moore, who started 17th, who's already finding himself up to fourth, who's been in the hunt all day, just doing a great job. Probably just feeling his way after that 360 degree spin that he did coming off of turn two. Let's not forget that. Greg Moore's day has been punctuated with a bit of excitement. Who turns three and four? A look once again at Blundell with Vassar behind him. Ooh, Vassar closing up. It goes underneath with authority. A nice run off the D center section of the track. Going into turn one. A nice draft. Timed it perfectly. Dropped down. Slid right underneath and carried on through. Let's take another look at these passing maneuvers. Keep in mind, all of this going on at tremendous speeds, 225 to 230 miles per hour. 
This was Blundell taking the position from Vassar. As Vassar came up on Parker Johnstone. See Blundell's running the high line, carrying speed and momentum. Cuts down low. And then he's going to take the air away from Jimmy as he slices up in front of him going down the back straight. Jan Bikas. Part of what you're seeing out on the racetrack is some people have stayed in sixth gear and other cars have gone to fifth gear. I can just update you on my half of the pit lane as far as the top runners. Parker Johnstone in sixth gear. Jimmy Vassar in sixth gear as well as Andre Barbero. They will not put it down into fifth, which is the one that brings the revs up and they can really crank it. They will not do that till the very end. Mark Blundell, on the other hand, will have to check on that one as he's on the other extreme end of the pits. All right, thank you, Jan. Vassar and Blundell continue their battle over second place. Now Vassar opening up a bit of a gap over the Englishman. Meanwhile, Parker Johnstone not far away. James Allen can add to this. Well, Jan, you raised the question. The answer is very simple. Mark Blundell using sixth gear as well. Back to you. All right, thank you, James. Parker Johnstone holds the fastest ever race lap in American competition. In fact, in world competition, 231.659 miles an hour. Set in the Marlboro 500 here at Michigan last year. Right now, he has the lead. Jimmy Vassar closing up just slightly. And now slower traffic. Hero Mitsusha. Parker Johnstone tried to use him to scrape Jimmy Vassar off his tail. But in fact, Vassar gets a run at him, gets up on the high line. Parker got caught out in that one. Matsushita up in the racing line, going way too slow. Couldn't run the normal line coming off of four. Had to drop down low, cut the RPMs. And look at Blundell run up. I wonder if Parker Johnstone has a problem. Well, just probably lost a little bit of momentum. As we're approaching lap 200, the last time we had a pit stop was on lap 163. So we've got to be entering into our fuel window now as we approached 198 to about 205. So very shortly, people are going to be coming in for what looks to be green pit stops under a green condition. And what a way to approach the climax of this inaugural US 500 to make the last pit stop under green the last stop of the day. There's Christian Fittipaldi in the pits for what looks like an extended stop. Seven cars on the lead lap. Vassar, Johnstone, Blundell, Moore, Ribeiro, Gujelman, and Herda. Marty Reed. Yeah, guys, we just passed the 200 lap mark. Keep number 213 in your mind. The longest fuel run that uh, Parker Johnstone has been able to make has been 37 laps. So the magic number for them is they have to get to lap 210. So as of now, that's what they're hoping for. Andre Ribeiro and Greg Moore side by side, dicing over fourth position. Well, you have got to be impressed with this new generation of IndyCar drivers. Greg Moore, perhaps the youngest man out there, Absolutely unflappable. He's been doing a great job today. Had a little bit of luck on his side when he went streaming through that big puff of smoke from the blown engine and just about scraped wheels with Christian Fittipaldi. Just one of the many adventures for Greg Moore today. Now Ribeiro down low. Trying to get a run at him on the back stretch. Should get a good slipstream here and slip underneath and going into three. And the Brazilian takes fourth place, dropping the Canadian back to fifth. And Greg Moore still looking for that first win. Well, still looking in his first season in IndyCar racing. It will come soon. Ribeiro has won at Rio de Janeiro earlier this year. Parker Johnstone has never won. He finished second at Long Beach this year behind Jimmy Vassar. A very emotional second place that was, not only for Parker, but for the whole team. And if he was to win here today, be a great lift for that Motorola team who has struggled like we talked about just a little bit earlier in the season. That was a good look at Greg Moore. Who swept the table or at least virtually did in Indy Lights competition a year ago winning 10 races as I recall running away with the championship absolutely bulletproof on the racetrack virtually everywhere the series went. There is Jimmy Vassar the race leader. With the possibility of adding $45,000 to the race winner's $1 million minimum. Keep in mind, the series champion on the PPG IndyCar World Series picks up a $1 million for the championship. Jimmy Vassar could earn that in one day here at Michigan. Vassar, who's leading the points, is on his way to maybe collecting a second million dollars as the points leader towards the end of the season. 
We just have a high total of income for the year. Probably more than he's made so far in all the other years combined. We are down to 15 cars. Report from the pits. Stefan Johansson has suffered engine failure on his car. That rear wing on the car twitching under the tremendous loads, trying to produce downforce. Coming up behind one of the Penske cars. Now you see the Ganassi crew in the pits, waiting for their man, Jimmy Vassar. This is the all-important final pit stop as he comes up behind Paul Tracy. Now he slows to make his pit entrance. A green flag stop coming. Ooh, Parker Johnstone going by at a tremendous clip. Here comes the race leader. Parker Johnstone takes the race lead as Vassar pits under green and Jan Bikas is there to greet him. At the moment, he has to keep his finger on the button, which will keep his car below. He, he locks the brakes up. He can't. Oh, man. For a moment, he thought that he wouldn't be able to stop on the marks, but he does bring it to a stop here. They're going for all four tires. They're not going to make a change. Remember that the fuel takes longer to flow at this particular point of time. They're waiting for the fuel. The tires are on. They have to wait. Now, Jimmy Vassar is underway. Lights him up. And this will be the last time we'll see him. 15.3 seconds. You saw Mark Blundell go by, and there's Parker Johnstone. Could he be out of fuel? Could be very, very close. We haven't seen a puff of smoke or anything come from the back of the car, but we talked about the last time that he was in the pit. He was back in lap 163, maybe just trying to stretch it a bit too far. Down to Marty Reed. Oh, guys, these guys are just heartbroken. He ran out of fuel in turn number three. That needed lap 213. They came nowhere near it, lap 208, and their chance of victory is just gone away. Oh, what a horrible break for this modestly budgeted team. He got so close to Jimmy Vassar, I thought for a minute Parker Johnstone might have been thinking about hitting along with Vassar, but just closed up too quickly. The visor is up, and you can see that helpless expression in the eyes of Parker Johnstone. Jan Bikas. There was some radio communication with Parker Johnstone under the last yellow. Parker called in and said, I think we need to save fuel. Should I be doing some drafting? They said, Parker, don't worry about that. Let us figure out the fuel. They said, you drive the car. We'll work on the fuel strategy. Sounds like Parker should have really listened to his own advice. Let's get down pit road. He pulls up behind the safety vehicle. Let's get down to James Allen. Well, the story of Pat West, as we said before, is a story of great teamwork, great pit stops. They came in, Blundell looked very relaxed, took on fuel, and now with this Johnstone incident, they thought that the yellow flag initially that they would take P1, but now they've decided they're going to come back and they're going to risk it. They're going to put some more fuel in and we'll update you on what that strategy will mean. Our 10th yellow flag of the day waves down to Marty Reed. Guys, this could be the break, biggest break of the day for Andre Ribeiro. They now will be able to make this in one more stop, and they'll be able to make the stop under yellow. Could be a great shootout now to the check. Now keep in mind, under the new pit rules, we will line the cars up, and all of the lead lap cars will be nose to tail when we return to Michigan. There is Jimmy Vassar. His service is complete. Andre Ribeiro and Greg Moore. Ribeiro, the race leader at this point. Greg Moore runs second. There is going to be an absolutely outstanding finish to the inaugural U.S. 500, and it's not far away. Stay with us. Back at Michigan, Mark Blundell, who has had such an exceptional race, brings his Raynard Ford Cosworth into the pits, and the crew goes to work. We are under a yellow flag, the 10th of the day, but time is everything and he stalls the car. You see a crewman reach for the starting mechanism at the back and put it into the back of the gearbox. Oh, and he almost pulled away from it. Oh, this is costly. And what a ill feeling. We've all done this, and your stomach just goes with a big lump. Seconds mean everything. Down to James Allen. Absolute heartbreak in the Mark Blundell pit. He lost at least 20 seconds when he stalled on that last time. And the reason he came in, just to remind you, was because he hadn't topped it up because of that problem they've got with the fuel valve. He's now got a full load of gas, but he lost himself quite a bit of time. So it remains to be seen what he's going to be able to do as we get into the closing stages of this race. Back to you. Thanks, James. Mark Blundell back on the racetrack. Seventh in order, one lap down. We have four cars on the lead lap as we prepare for a restart. There's your leader, Andre Ribeiro, with the bright yellow nose on the car. Mauricio Gujelmin runs second behind him, followed by Greg Moore and Brian Herta, the only other cars on the lead lap. 
The drivers now being shown the crossed flags, which means we will have a start next time by. The double file is now being formed up. Let's get back down to the pit lane and Jan Bikas. Well, there's some big discussions going on down here between IndyCar and Chip Ganassi Racing, and that is because earlier on, Andrew Ribeiro, who got caught by the pace car, you remember, they let him go by and pick up at the tail end of the lead lap. Now this is a similar scenario for Vassar. He's behind the pace car. They want to ask IndyCar to let him pass to rejoin at the back like they did earlier for Andrew Ribeiro. But at the moment, looks like we're getting ready for green. The discussion still continuing. All right, thank you. There you see the IndyCar official talking to the tower. The Ganassi crew awaits the decision. It remains to be seen if they'll give them the start this time by or hold them until we have that decision. There is Steve Horn from Tasman Motorsports. That's Andre Ribeiro's car owner. Lights are still on on the safety car. Blundell's problems continue. He pitted out of sequence. We are told that he will move to the back of the line as a result. There you see him following Gilles de Ferran in the bright yellow car. Excuse me, that's Hiro Matsushita behind de Ferran. We'll see where they slot Mark Blundell in. Right now, I think he's just off to the left of your screen. have to drop back there he is dropping back he'll drop onto the lower line this new system may take a lap or two just to perfect but I'll tell you it's the greatest thing for the drivers who are all in the lead lap which are four to come down to the start and finish line and take the green especially this battle to the end of the event the last 35 laps that we're going to have no traffic in, in the way of any lap cars or anything of that nature very important when you're coming down to the restart, you know you're just going racing with a guy that's immediately in front of you or behind you. The pace car lights are now off. Looks like they're going to leave Vassar right behind the pace car. Parker Johnstone is to the left, so he's the lead of the lap cars. Marty Reed has more from the pit lane. Well, things are getting interesting in Andre Ribeiro's pit. Just talked to Steve Horn. He confirmed for us. I said, you look awful concerned. I thought you had enough fuel. He says, tell you the truth, we really don't know because we lost telemetry early in the race. We've been doing all the calculations manually, and right now they're not quite sure. All right, thanks, Marty. Down to the line they come, and we are racing once again. Andre Ribeiro was at the front of the lead, uh, lead lap cars. Jimmy Vassar at the head of the lap cars, and there you see Vassar who has rocketed into the lead, making up his lap. That puts him back on the lead lap. Parker Johnstone just behind him, but Johnstone shown in 10th place, three laps down after running out of fuel. So right now remains to be seen if in the laps remaining, we're working lap number 216 of 250, whether Jimmy Vassar can get around. He's on the lead lap. He may need right now more than anything is a yellow flag. And Brian Herta's car is moving slowly across the start finish line as Vassar flashes down the backstretch. The running order is Andre Ribeiro, Mauricio Gujamin, and Greg Moore. There you see Brian Herta crawling around. Interesting to note on the engine front, we have a Honda, a Ford, and a Mercedes in the top three spots. This will be a big disappointment for Team Ray Hall. From our Honda Helicam, you watch the race leaders running in a bunch. And that's what the new pit rules were designed to make happen. You saw Brian Herta down on the apron, continuing to creep around. I don't think he'll make it all the way around. We'll see if they throw the yellow flag to send. Yes, they do. We have a full course caution. Jan Bikas. I'm chasing Chip Ganassi down the pit lane. He's looking for Brian Herta's pit because he was going to have to ask them. He doesn't need to now, but he was going to ask for some assistance. Chip Ganassi was going to tell them, make sure that he actually stops on the racetrack. How's Praise your heart? The Praise How's the Lord. You were going to tell him actually to have him stop it on the racetrack oh, so he I could get a yell. Well, why else would you run down to talk to him? I was going to wish him good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Well, two quick things, guys, that have happened here. Number one, Tasman gets what they need. They get a yellow to help conserve fuel. Number two, Vassar gets to come around behind the pack that's now leading and gets back onto the lead lap. So Chip Ganazzi gets his wish, even though he was just going to go down and wish them good luck. You see Herta's car. It'll be towed back to the pits. 
as the laps continue to run down, we will be back for what should be a most dramatic finish to the first running of the U.S. 500 here in Michigan. Jimmy Vassar's not out of it yet. Stay with us. ESPN Speed World coverage of the inaugural U.S. 500 has been brought to you by Honda, who offers an impressive family of cars, sport utility vehicles, and minivans. By Target. At Target, you can expect more and pay less. And by Texaco Haviland Formula 3 Motor Oil. Controls volatility and fights vaporization. Thirty-one laps remain in the inaugural running of the U.S. 500. We are under our 11th caution of the day. Here's a look at our race summary. Andre Ribeiro leads. The average speed of the race to date, 153 miles an hour in change, 10 liters. Cars out of the race continue to mount. But the attrition, as we mentioned before, has not been as stout as we thought originally it might be. Let's get down to Marty Reed in the pit lane. Look at Steve Horn's face if you get a chance. I mean, these guys are really still concerned. What's happened is their telemetry, as we said, was gone, but they have been trying to do it by the calculator, and then the onboard dash is telling them one lap that they've got less fuel pressure, the next lap it's back. They said, Steve asked, I asked him, where are you? He says, we really don't know. He says, we're just going to have to go and hold on tight. Well, Steve Horn has had an interesting experience at 500-mile races, as you well know, Scott Goodyear. That is for sure. After Indianapolis last year and then uh, having an opportunity to win here. Really a young team, although he's been involved in IndyCars for many, many years back in the uh, Budweiser True Sports days with Bobby Rahal and Scott Pruitt and went off and started running the Indy Lights series. And I think they just about dominated that series for a couple of years. So we're coming back to green. The four cars and the high groove. Andre Ribeiro. Mauricio Gujami, Greg Moore, and Jimmy Vassar. We saw Vassar go by the pace cars who went to commercial. He's been sent all the way around to get him on the tail of a lead lap. But now we come down to the green, and Gujami makes his move to the inside of Ribeiro, but there's just too much traffic. Keep in mind, those cars on the low line can blend into the toe. Parker Johnstone has made up a lap. He runs at the head of the queue, followed by Ribeiro with the bright yellow nose on the car. There's Greg Moore, the blue and white player's car. Greg seems like he slipped by Gujamin on that last uh, restart. Down through turns one and two with that big gaggle of traffic that they had there. 30 laps for $1 million is Andre Ribeiro, who was beside himself on the podium at Rio earlier this year when he won the debut race in Rio de Janeiro for the Indy cars. Fellow Brazilian Mauricio Gujamin just behind. What will Andre Ribeiro do if someone hands him a check for a million U.S.? Lots of slower traffic mixed up with the race leaders at this point. Benjamin closed up on Moore, but now Moore drives away just that little bit. All of this dueling going on at 200 and high 20 miles per hour. Jimmy Vassar now closes up, looking for third place from Guzelman. A couple of things are going on here. Ribeiro wants to run as fast as possible to keep in front of the guys that are behind him but almost go as slow as possible because he needs to conserve fuel. He wants to run that car in sixth gear and top gear, keep the revs low, keep the fuel consumption low. But at the same time, he wants to try and draw away if that's at all possible. I say slower cars. Actually, a lot of these guys circulating at competitive speeds, they just happen to be one or more laps down. Our top four cars covered by less than one and a half seconds. Marty Reed. Oh, and Greg Moore loses an engine. The second place car, Greg Moore, loses an engine in the biggest possible way. He kept it under control. Did a great job. He set a back in, squirming the car, just almost getting the oil in the tires, I'm sure. 225 miles an hour. You saw the back end of the car doing small fishtails, and he hung on, didn't go high, didn't go low, kept it in the center of the track, did a nice job of bringing it down onto the apron. 230 miles an hour was the last lap speed for Greg Moore. And we saw that before when Alex Zanardi lost his Honda after a lap in the 233 range. This is our 12th yellow. We are one away from the record for a 500 mile race here at Michigan. And not one person has left the grandstand as best I can tell. They know this finish is going to be a classic. The folks are on their feet. This is going to be a shootout. 
The smoke still rests on the backstretch from Greg Moore's Mercedes-Benz engine paying the ultimate price. There you see it. Greg Moore climbs out. James Allen. With Tony Brunetti, the team manager, Greg Moore's team manager. Apparently over the radio, he said it was too bad. This was our race. Your feelings? Yeah, for sure. That's exactly what he said. I, I, you know, all day we've just been waiting to race till the end. And, uh, you know, this was the time to go racing, and we were getting ready to do just that. Unfortunately, uh, something in the motor let go. And, uh, you know, I, th I think uh, this, this race was probably ours. Well, bad luck. We'll hope to cover word with Greg in a second. All right, thanks very much. There you see. Boy, it hardly serves to call it a plume of smoke. That is the story of 500 mile racing. Twist your engine to all the revs you dare, but keep in mind what can happen if you stray to that red line too many times. We see Greg Moore looking a bit philosophical for a guy barely into his 20s, racing in one of the elite forms of open wheel motorsport in the entire world. He knows that better days lie ahead. So our 12th caution with 226 laps complete. Leaves Andre Ribeiro in the lead over Mauricio Gujelmin. And there is still a lot of blue smoke in the air out there on the infield. Here's Marty Reed. Well, guys, right before Greg Motor, Greg Moore's motor blew up, uh, Steve Horn came right by me. He says, I still don't know where we're at, but we're going for it. We didn't come here to finish fourth. I looked at him just now. I said, do you have enough now? He says, well, we're breathing a little bit easier, but they, they still are concerned because they're getting so much false readings from their telemetry on the dashboard. So what they're reporting from the racetrack back here is really confusing them. Well, there you see Andre Ribeiro using every yellow lap to conserve fuel down to Young Vikas. Excuse me, to James Allen. I'm down here with Greg Moore. Greg, a very disappointed man, no doubt. You said it was your race. You must have felt that way. Yeah, I, I was really, really uh, looking forward to this race. I mean, you know, the last half of the race, I made one little mistake. Car was lucky enough, to, you know, that uh, we didn't have any problems with it. And, you know, uh, good luck went our way for the first, you know, two thirds of the race. And we just had one little problem here at the end. And motor broke, but it's 500 miles. It's tough on a motor. And I mean, uh, we saw a Honda break, we've seen Ford's break. I guess now we've seen a Mercedes break. What's been the secret today of running quick, do you think? Has it been drafting? How have you lived with the Hondas? Oh, really, it's just been, uh, you know, going as fast as you can the whole race. I mean, we're doing 229, 228 mile an hour laps, and it's just unbelievably fast. Thanks so much, Greg. Bad luck. Thanks. I think Greg Moore has a bit of a problem with minimalization. He called that huge smoky spin we saw earlier a little problem. And now this tremendous plume of smoke from his Mercedes, also a little problem. Andre Ribeiro is up front. Here's Jan Bikas. A quick report from the Ganassi crew, in particular Jimmy Vassar. We talked to Julian Robertson, who was watching very carefully. He said, we're happy with the handling of the car, but it doesn't work well below 224 miles an hour if we get slowed in traffic. But if we can run faster than that, anything above 227, the car is happy. We think we can win this. But if we get slowed down, the car is very nervous. The faster, the better for Vassar. We're going to stay with this one all the way to the checkered flag. The green flag is in the hands of Jim Swintow. Down to the line they come. Three drivers at this point still with a shot at the million dollars. Andre Ribeiro, Mauricio Gujelmin, and Jimmy Vassar attacks Gujelmin for second. Can he get it done? No. He tried the low line, wasn't able to get through. Maybe that's a traffic situation that we just heard him talk about. The key thing here is that Ribeiro's up front. Tracy's right behind him, obviously, a couple of laps down, followed by Marino. But both Vassar and Gujeman are going to be having a couple of lap cars in between Ribeiro and themselves. Gujeman with that little bit of breathing space before Vassar is back on the attack. Now Vassar goes low. Once again, doesn't have it when he gets down there in one. Can't get it done. 20 laps left to go. They're not going to want to lose touch right now with Andre Ribeiro. One never knows if the Tasman team is being up front and telling you that they might have a fuel problem. I can't believe that they're thinking that they might have a fuel problem with this many yellows that we've had since they first reported that they were concerned about fuel. The field streams across the start-finish stripe. From behind Roberto Moreno comes Jimmy Vassar. He continues to press Mauricio Gujelmin. Now Gujamin with about a 15 car length advantage. Meanwhile, Andre Ribeiro up front is no doubt scanning in his mirrors. 
behind this battle for the lead between Rivera, Gujamin, and Vassa. Roberto Moreno was actually mixed up in that group in fourth place, though he is a lap down. And Eddie Lawson running very close to him is in fifth place. So they're battling for position, which gives them a good reason to let it all hang out and not worry too much about where the race leaders are. Now Gujamin making a move underneath Tracy. Although it's not a pass for position, it's a pass for a placement on the racetrack. Vassa looking for a way to come to terms with Mauricio Gujelmin. Jan Bika says more on him. Of course, one of the ways to come to terms with him, Bob, would be to go to fifth gear instead of sixth. Though I asked that of team manager, team manager Tom Anderson, and he said, we are not going into fifth gear at the moment. We need to get closer. What a battle happening here. Vassar looking for any way he can get by, trying to take advantage of Tracy being a lap vehicle and trying to get underneath Gujelmin at the same time. That earlier Vassar, they took some downforce out of the car, but it seems anytime he gets up close behind somebody, he loses that downforce. Maybe he's getting a little too loose when he's in the turbulent air behind someone in close quarters. Well, whatever it is, he's got to work with it now because if they don't have another stop or another yellow, we certainly don't need fuel. These guys do not have any opportunity to come in. And you can see how the car twitches as he's trying to make it three high going into one. What a great move. Paul not Tracy. only does he get past Tracy, he also gets Gujamin, and now he's into second. Paul Tracy kept Mauricio Gujamin occupied. Jimmy Vassar went around the long way and got it done. I thought it was going to get a little tight up there by the concrete wall. But now there is nobody between race leader Andre Ribeiro and the pursuing car of Jimmy Vassar. Some great battles going on here. We saw in the back of that screen Roberto Marino trying to split the two cars as he's although he's a lap down and he got squeezed out and had to be pushed aside. All this going on at 230 miles an hour. 16 laps remain. 32 miles for a million dollars for one of these drivers. Andre Ribeiro and Jimmy Vassar. Yambikas. When you saw that move with Vassar and all of a sudden he gained all that momentum, we wondered, did he drop it into fifth gear? Tom Anderson says no, they stayed in sixth. What he did was he built the momentum, he built the toe and got a slingshot. And now he's trying to do the same thing to Andre Ribeiro, but they haven't gone into the killer gear yet. They're gonna try and do it in sixth gear and not blow this Honda up. How many revs do you take by going six as opposed to fifth? Oh, every team is a little bit different, but I suspect here it could be anywhere from 250 to 350. But the key thing is that you certainly get a better run coming off the turn, a little bit more horsepower maybe coming down the straightaway, but you're also going up a little higher at max RPMs, and the Hondas might run somewhere around 14,000. But let's not forget, we're talking about Vassar. Andre Ribeiro has the Honda in there also, probably running in sixth gear. So when the time comes to go, Maybe both of them will drop it down to fifth, and we're going to have a great battle on our hands. Vassar looking low as he continues to close the gap to Andre Ribeiro. Both men winners in this young IndyCar season. Two of the great young stars of IndyCar who have come here to Michigan for the inaugural running of the U.S. 500. And this is what it is all about. A fraction of a second between them, traveling at 230 miles an hour, reeling off the miles with a prize of one million dollars waiting for one of them. And the tension along the pit wall can almost be felt as their teams watch their guys go. There are no more pit stops remaining for either man. It is completely in the hands of these two young drivers. There is Andre Ribeiro's crew, Steve Horn in the white cap. Engineers nodding at one another. Does anyone really know what's going on out on the racetrack at this time? Slower traffic down low as the race leaders come through, completing one more lap. Nice, clean racetrack, no traffic in front. Great opportunity to go racing. Both these guys just starting to play games. Andre's looking and seeing, maybe is he in fifth, is he in sixth? Has to go through with the thinking process. Obviously worried about fuel, we are told. Vassar trying to get a slipstream, trying to maybe conserve fuel, run the car in sixth gear. Parker Johnstone's coming in, looking at the back of the car, a little bit of smoke, steering wheel coming off. It looks like Parker's day is done. And Vassar tried down low, but didn't get the job done. Andre being able to run the car right in the middle of the track. Parker Johnstone retires from eighth position. Jimmy Vassar, you can almost see it with his head down. Reeling off laps, approaching 230 miles per hour. And now the chess game gets serious. Where will he approach? 
Where will he try to make the pass? Vassar down low, but Ribeiro runs well up high. We're going to have a black flag for Christian Fittipaldi, who is apparently leaking some kind of fluid. Ten laps to go, 20 miles. As we see Christian Fittipaldi running low in the group. He's been doing that for about the last 10 or 15 laps. Probably just trying to collect some points. Vassar getting a good toe off of Ribeiro. And Problems. Ribeiro. Ribeiro's got problems. He dives for the pit lane. Something has gone wrong in the young Brazilian's car. Jimmy Vassar is all alone up front down to Marty Reed. The fueling rig is out. It looks like all their telemetry was exactly screwing up their heads because they just didn't have any idea. It showed that he was down low. They put the fuel hose in. They're just going to give him enough to get going. He's back out, but the race is over. Yeah. There is Chip Ganassi watching all of this unfold. Jan Bikas. Well, Marty, don't forget that when we talked to Steve Horn earlier, he said that because it was the spare car, they had no telemetry. So they did not really have an accurate reading other than what they could do with their calculators. So Ruffaro falls victim to the fact they don't have the latest electronics on the spare car. Once again, Lady Luck desserts. Steve Horn and his team's 500-mile competition. Jimmy Vassar, remember, started from pole. There is Parker Johnstone. That's one of the crewmen on Parker Johnstone's car. Johnstone has vacated the machine. What a day they have had. With so much help from so many different entities to keep them in this race. And they had a shot at that million bucks. As the car smokes from the rear. Jimmy Vassar led 18 laps. Took the lead back on lap 240. Back down to Marty Reed. Uh, guys, now the truth really comes out. Steve Horn just came by after the fuel stuff. He says, I guess I can tell you now. He says, all day long we've been having a fuel pickup problem. It wouldn't get the last 10 gallons. We knew we had enough, but we couldn't get it into the motor. All right, thank you, Marty. Jimmy Vassar up high. The nearest car, Mauricio Gugelmin, is 3.3 seconds behind. And the laps continue to tick down. This time by, next time by, there will be five laps remaining for Jimmy Vassar. The only current IndyCar driver to win a 500-mile pole and race in the same year at Michigan, Michael Andretti, who dropped out of this race with mechanical problems early on. That was back in 1987. There you see Mauricio Gugelmin running in second place, but he's dropping further back. He is now 3.9 seconds behind. Behind Gugelmin, Andre Ribeiro is in third. Roberto Moreno, fourth. Mark Blundell, fifth. Even if Gujaman finishes second today, it'll be a great day for Pac West with a second and fifth place finish. Probably a little bit more than what they expected a couple weeks ago when they qualified both cars and had difficulty qualifying in the middle of the pack. As you take a look at the running order, the story right now is all Jimmy Vassar. If he can win it, and he is just four laps from the checkered flag, he will pick up his fourth victory of the year. If the race were to end right now, he would have 94 points in the championship. A stout lead over the second place of Al Unzer, who at this point will total 58 points at the end of the day. So Jimmy Vassar in what could be the pivotal moment of the season for him in the first running of the U.S. 500. If Jimmy wins, this will certainly be a clean sweep with $100,000 that we talked about for the pole position earlier on with a marble award. He'll pick up $45,000 extra dollars for winning the race from the pole. And obviously the $1 million in the Vanderbilt Trophy. Couldn't ask for anything better in the month of May. After qualifying, he said he was going to go out and buy mom a new car. Right now he could buy her a fleet of cars. The way things are going for Jimmy Vassar. Two laps remaining. Four miles to go. With a driver from San Francisco, California, who has spent most of his life racing one thing or another. He was a legend for his tenacity and achievement in the Toyota Atlantic Series. He has made his way to Indy cars. His former car owner, Jim Hayhoe, went to Chip Ganassi and said, you've got to give this guy a shot. Ganassi put him on his team, and look what Jimmy Vassar has done. White flag for Jimmy Vassar. He goes by Andre Ribeiro, who was so much of a part of this race in the closing laps. Now on the backstretch. And now he'll be listening to that Honda motor. 
watching his Firestone tires. Once again, that little twitch on the backstretch that we've been watching all day. Onto the high banks, past the pit end, the crowd comes to its feet as checkers and American flags wave for the winner of the inaugural US 500, Jimmy Vassar. Here comes Mauricio Gugelmi, who will come home in second. The idea for waving the checker and American flags came to IndyCar from six-year-old Jonathan Block of Allentown, Pennsylvania. There you go, Jonathan. As Chip Ganassi congratulates his crew. Let's get down to Marty Reed. I'll tell you what, I don't think I've ever seen you jump that high. Oh, man, I'll tell you what. With Alex, the job he did today, Jimmy, the job he's doing, the job he's doing all year, the team, those guys came out, the team is the best. My team's the best. They came out with their spare car and won the race. They're the greatest. <laughs> They're heading for victory lane, guys. Well, every race goes into the record books, but it's the rare race that provides history, and we have seen it today. The inaugural running of the US 500 produces victory for Jimmy Vassar, the Vanderbilt Cup, and a check for a million dollars. We'll be back. Welcome back to Michigan International Speedway. There are some days when Mother Nature gets you in a headlock and just won't let you go. There is Jimmy Vassar in victory lane. Here is how his day began at the inaugural US 500. Jimmy Vassar was on pole as the race came down to the start to the green flag before the race ever began. He made contact with Adrian Fernandez and Jimmy Vassar found himself hard into the trackside wall. The race was red flagged. Vassar hopped into his backup car. Throughout the day, he battled his way back to the front of this field. And after 250 hard laps of racing, Jimmy Vassar finds himself in victory lane, the winner of the inaugural US 500. His name will be inscribed on the Vanderbilt Cup, and he will accept a check for $1 million, the winner's share of a purse in excess of three and a half million. An astonishing way to begin the day, but it ended in the best way possible for Jimmy Vassar and the Target Ganassi team. Here's Jan Bikas. Well, the biggest beating that Jimmy Vassar took today was not in the race car for 500 miles. It was by your crew when you got out. These guys just start beating you up when you yeah, got out. Beat me up, but I got some sore knees from that start deal. I don't know what happened there. I mean, I was just holding my line coming down. Somebody hit me in the back, and it's amazing to run the spare car like this. It's definitely not as quick as our primary, and we were struggling with it all day long. And that's all true credit to the Target Chip Ganassi team. And my heart goes out to Alex, my teammate, who was really hooked up and running well. But, uh, you know, we won. We still won as a team. And the team really won this race today, all the hard work we did. And uh, I'd like to thank Chip and, and Bob from Target here. It's great. Who needs milk? But tell me, though, when that crash happened, did you ever think in your wildest dreams you'd be standing here in Victory Circle? Well, we pit under the green on our last stop, and we went a lap down. And that was I was just really bummed out about that. But then... You know, good fortune. It seems like we've been getting it all season long, you know, and uh, we were able to come back around. And I knew with 30 laps to go, we had a good car, and I could, you know, Rivero, I was just sizing him up, and uh, I don't know what happened to him there. He really slowed down, but I think we were going to get him anyway. But, uh, you know, all credit to the Target Ship Ganassi team to put the spare car on the grid and go out and win. That was great. Jimmy Vassar, he wins a million dollars. But what I want to know, I wonder if he's going to share any of that million dollars with Brian Herta that brought out that yellow flag. Let's get up to James Allen. Well, equal scenes of joy here at Pac West. Mauricio Guzman, a fantastic second place and a great run today. Well, we're talking in the beginning. The crew did a fantastic job. The Hollywood Pac West team put the car together. After that crash, it was unbelievable. And we had to chase the car early on to get a good balance. It was pushing too much. We adjust the car, and in the end, it was perfect. Lacking a little bit of horsepower, but the crew really deserve it. I just drove what they gave me. And Bob, they were only using a Ford XB engine. How about that? Back to you. Well, I guess that just proves that engine power isn't absolutely everything. Let's take a look at the final results of the inaugural US 500 as the celebrations continue down in victory lane. Jimmy Vassar wins six, excuse me, four of the first six races of the year. First man since Johnny Rutherford in 1980 to do that. 7th through 12th, Paul Tracy, Al Unzer Jr., who remains second in the points chase. There you see the rest of the standings. Greg Moore, what a day he had, threatened for victory, a big spin, and finally the engine let go. An extraordinary day for everyone involved. We knew it would be dramatic, but we could not have possibly known how dramatic this day would be. Jimmy Vassar remains the man to beat in IndyCars. 
Here's a look at the point standings. Vassar now with a 36 point lead over Al Unzer Jr. Scott Pruitt in third, followed by Andre Ribeiro, Jill DeFerrand, and Greg Moore. It's going to be a great season of IndyCar racing. Let's get down to Marty Reed. In the history of the first US 500, you're gonna be in the record books as far as putting on a great show. Andre Ribeiro, fourth place, but your thoughts on this run? You came back so strong there. Well, the car was definitely very good. The team made a fantastic job. Thank you very much to all the guys. But unfortunately, we had a problem with uh, the fuel pickup and uh, we had to do one extra pit stop. And on the last two laps, we were having a big misfire because of the fuel. I'll tell you what though, guys, they love him in this camp, don't you? Yeah. 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 All right, well done, Andre Ribeiro. A little bit of disappointment, perhaps, at coming up slightly short. On June 2nd, the IndyCar Series will continue on ABC Sports with the Miller 200 from West Allis, Wisconsin.